September 4th, 1867. Today we left for Lower Fort Garry, our York boats laden with cargo for the company. Our companions are fresh-faced Highland laddies, harnessed beside the brown-skinned Cree. From dawn till dusk they toil on a diet civilized society might not consider fit for dogs. The days of these ancient Homeric struggles are nearly over. But with God as my witness, I have seen the proud passage of the York boat and witnessed the glorious journey of their company of adventurers. On a spring morning in Winnipeg in the year 2001, Jamie Brown is looking for a new company of adventurers. He's producing a television program to recreate one of those glorious journeys. Three, one, two, three. All right. A York boat has been built which will sail from Winnipeg to Hudson Bay if the right crew can be found. More than 500 people have applied for a seat in the boat. Jamie will pick just eight. We're trying to make it as close to the experience out there as possible. This is a kilometer with 182 pounds in your back, and, and the longest portage is 1.6 kilometers. A lot of them are shorter, but they'll have to basically do this. And the, the trip men carried two 90-pound packs on their back, and in fact, some were reputed to have carried three, which um, after carrying this, it seems hard to believe, but uh, I guess they could if you did it all the time. My hips bothering me. She's struggling. She is really struggling. She's got lots of guts, but she's struggling. It's not only guts Jamie Brown is looking for. Can I use the railing? Yeah. Help with that bag. to break your leg. Come on. He's building a team of men and women who will live the brutal life of a fur trade Yorkman. Perfect. Perfect. Their food, their shelter, their clothing. Everything they'll need to survive will be as it was in 1840. They're amazing. We've got great candidates again. Um, I think the difficulty of this test and the struggling you're seeing right now with people who are in amazing shape and work outdoors, work with heavy weights, um, he carries stuff around every day, and uh, we're pushing people to their absolute limit on this, so I think it's a good test for what they're in for. <laughs> if they're selected, they'll be paid $10,000. First, they must agree to police checks and psychological profiling. They'll also have to sign a contract agreeing to live completely as the York men of 1840 did. It's called staying period appropriate. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. You sure? Yeah. Okay, it's your, business, your, your decision. I want to make sure that you... Yeah. I... All right. Good effort. That's harder than I thought. Start carrying moose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. Right okay, now I feel like I'm going to barf and yeah. pass out. So. No living human has done the journey they'll attempt. This agonizing physical test is designed to find those who'll have a fighting chance of finishing it. That's about as far as I could go. That was about it. The selection is over. The team meets. Two members are out of town, but the others come to the television company's office to discuss the project. They're a cross-section of Canadians, fit and strong, but there are no super athletes on this boat. Kevin Mustard is a high school history teacher from Hamilton, Ontario. The water being supplied Maritz Lunenberg, a sailor and carpenter. Beside him is Ken Albert Jr., a young Cree man who works for Manitoba Hydro. Jeff Cowie is completing his master's degree. He has family links to the fur trade. His great-grandfather traveled the same route Jeff will try. And Rosanna Schick will be the only woman on board. Although rare, women did work on York boats. Their lives were lonely and hard. The youngest member of the team is Randall Shore, a university student and local hockey star. 
did have very Mike very Scoofs is the backup in case someone quits really people, or is injured. And you guys have amazing, amazing talents um, in a lot of things, and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing them come out on the trip. Our whole goal is just it's got to be period appropriate, and it's cool. got to be, you know, what a typical boat would have. Right. And there's a real sensitivity out there in the audience about, and what they love about this is the challenge and the realness of it. And the more we work to make it real, the better it's going to be for everybody at the end when the audience sees that, you know, you really did do this unbelievable undertaking like Yorkman. There you can drink the water. The water and it will be an unbelievable abs. undertaking. 1,200 kilometers of lake, bush, and whitewater, from the 21st century to the 19th, driven relentlessly northward by courage, history, and teamwork. Yeah. In that sense, I would really feel uncomfortable with one person having a veto over what the other seven feel. Uh, amongst eight people, we can come to some kind of consensus where, you know, through discussion, and that people will all feel comfortable. I don't think we have to look at it as a veto so much. Not to discuss it and uh, make sure you make the right decision, because there's no... Uh, a rapid is unforgiving, like you hit a rock and spill us over, or the end of the boat, the boat. and that's it. All of us at one point or another is going to have to face a, a fear. Whether or not, you know, it's a wind or waves or water or uh, rapids or bugs or the, the unknown. You have to approach it logically and respectfully <coughs> and cautiously because yes. it's always in control. Like, no matter how powerful you think you are, I mean, you can never outpower Mother Nature. It's yes. what it is. There's almost two types of respect here. One, respect for each other, uh, and, and, the, and the respect for the terrain and the water that we're traveling. Their quest will be to travel deep into the heart of northern Canada, tracing a centuries-old fur trade route. Starting in Winnipeg, they'll follow the Red River to the inland sea known as Lake Winnipeg. Crossing to its east side, They'll row 400 kilometers to the Cree community of Norway House, where they'll turn northeast and struggle through the beaver dams and swamps of the Etchimamish. Finally, they'll enter the Great Hayes River and fight their way across its many rapids until reaching the York Factory Fur Depot on the edge of Hudson Bay. The York boat was the transportation backbone of the fur trade. It opened up the north during the 18th and 19th centuries, as the bush plane did in the 20th. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Three weeks before departure, the crew meet their York boat for the first time. That's exactly what I, exactly I envisioned, wow. you know, a big, solid, honking boat. <laughs> Team member Paul Gosson has arrived. He's a part-time river guide and full-time optimist. It's going to be very interesting. <laughs> Stop! Good. Need another board. One, two, one. E. Get ready up here. It's going to keep going. Yeah. Forty feet long, eight feet wide, weighing over a ton. The boat was handmade in Manitoba from spruce and tamarack. By the time the journey is over, it will have taken on a personality of its own and played an important part in the lives of the crew. It will also have saved some of them from serious injury. Larry Duncan is a member of the Cree Nation and York boat expert. He's been hired to teach the crew how to handle the big boat. You have to decide to pick who. The first bit will probably be the, how, how the importance of rowing together as a team and they got to go through the rhythm, the technique of the ruin. So some of these guys, I know they're kayakers, they're salesmen or whatever. They, and they got, to, they got to work as a team, and that's what you got to do first. You got to get them into the rhythm. York boats are tough to row. They're heavy and unforgiving. But Larry knows his business. His message, work together and respect the boat. Kevin, is it Kevin or one of you guys? Is Pull harder, you're not pulling hard. <laughs> when you're not rowing, you can pull your oar in, okay? Pull the oar in, pull them in, that way you won't... It'll, it'll be, the oar will be safe. You gotta take care of your oar all the time. That's most important. That's your... That's your machine that's your here. Yeah, that's the motor here. Okay, push this out, Lottie. 
Watch me go out, just dip your oar in the water. The oars alone weigh 50 pounds each and are not for the faint of heart or weak of muscle. Okay, right. When he pulls it, you gotta pull it. Hold on. Go, be ground to be focused all the time. Concentrate. When that oar will pin you. Very. It'll knock you off the water, off the boat. When that happens, you gotta, you gotta swim. Pull, that oar and you pull it hard, pull it up as hard as you can. Because either you or that oar will break. Lock and guard, guys, lock and guard. First week is going to hurt a lot. It's going to hurt every morning when we get up and start. Lord. I honestly think after a week, maybe 10 days, it will settle into a, like a pattern. Our muscles will settle in and I think we'll be all right. They're a cheerful group who think all they need is a bit of practice. Okay, let me move my seat. I, I Most either canoe or sail. But none of them have tackled a journey like this before. What they lack in experience, they more than make up for in enthusiasm. Seasoned callous hands. Oh yeah, there's, see, there's a blister right there. Actually, a little broken blister. Yeah, I'm going to lose my guitar boring. calluses and well, pick up rowing there. calluses. We're going to be stacked. We're going to have big, big muscles <laughs> if everything goes well, because it's, it's, uh, it's all about rhythm, I think. Once we get our rhythm going, it's going to go well. And we've got a good teacher. It'll be a little different, I think. Um, I've never really been on an extended trip with only men. It, there's always been, uh, actually, it's been mostly women or, you know, mixed men and women. So it, the dynamic will be a little bit different. Um, but I think I'll fit in okay. Uh, the guys seem really nice. And um, I think my biggest concern is that I can hold my own physically. That's obviously going to be the biggest challenge for me. I love the thought of, of surviving by, partly by wit and by, by strength and, and by tenacity. Um, and it's, I've always, I've always liked the, the idea of, uh, of facing tough, tough challenges. But Larry Duncan knows what lies ahead. The route is anything but easy. The most important thing they have to do is to rely on their higher power, to rely on the God as they believe in Him. That's who they, uh, each morning before they take off, they should be grateful for what to, that God has given them what to do. They give them all the strength, they give them the tools, the body, the mind, and the spirit. And they, when they rely on that, they should be able to make it. July 1st, launch day. In a routine familiar to boat crews across the ages, job one is to stow the gear. York boats carried about three tons of cargo. This one carries the same. The crew have also been given extra clothes, a pipe, and one blanket each. They pack light because eventually they'll have to portage everything on board. Well, I don't think we need to worry about it staying dry today now because we got the sponges and as soon as we see water starting to lap those boards again we'll, we'll start sponging it out. Crew member Rob Clark is an investment analyst from Vancouver. He's a mountain climber not a sailor and is worried about the boat. Well it was a little disconcerting to find that after pulling the boat out yesterday and uh, um, patching the hull that we had about a foot of water in the bottom of the boat and some of the food that we thought we had high and dry got wet. But uh, we did some quick repairs this morning and we're hoping it'll be more manageable. Yes, sir. It's Canada Day. Thousands of well-wishers show up at Winnipeg's historic junction of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers to bid them farewell and to hear Jamie Brown describe the life of the 1840s Yorkman. Today, eight intrepid individuals will start a 1,200-kilometer journey that will take them all the way to Hudson Bay. As they retrace the traditional fur trade route, their diet will consist of lard, dried meat, and dried berries in the form of pemmican, bannock, and a few potatoes washed down with some tea. I'd like to introduce our team of Yorkmen, starting with Ken Albert, Jr., Rob Clark, 
Jeff Cowie, Paul Gossen, Maritz Lunenberg, Kevin Mustard, Randall, it's just standing in the back here, <laughs> um, and Rosanna Schick. I'd like to toast to a safe journey. Godspeed. Go Clusters. Godspeed. How are you going to handle potential conflict between uh, crew members? Keel hauling. <laughs> We've got 10 here. He's our enforcer. If anyone gets out of line, they're overboard. The media treat the New Age Yorkmen as stars. This is their first time in front of the cameras. And they handle the transition from obscurity to celebrity with grace and humor. Things like that. Are you leaving toilet paper behind you? I'm afraid so. It's going to be pretty rough. So how do you hope to deal with that particular problem? It's a very practical one. <laughs> well, they gave us a little cloth, but after you use it the first time, I'm not sure what you do after that. I think it'll be more a matter of looking for moss and leaves. <laughs> How are you feeling? Uh, anxious to get going. Just really want to get out and, and start rowing. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Oh, yeah. About your nose. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's be nice to get going. Get away from everybody. Row, row, zero. Veteran television director Don Young has joined the crew to film the voyage. I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's ever done this before, and it'll be something I'll be extremely proud of to have been part of. Boy, I hope I hope this all works out okay, because there's so many unknowns out there for them, and uh, I think they're ready though. Push off that side, and then the current will take us out, and then we'll draw that line in at the end. Okay? Okay, good. Very good. All right. There we go. My name is Gordy Ross. My age is three and thirty. I'm a tripman for the HBC. My work is hard and dirty. Sometimes I ache unto my bones. My work is hard and dirty. My father was an ordinary man, a fur trade man was he. My mother was his country wife, a woman of the free. And I was born to the fur trade life in 1843. Oh, the river flows, the free wind blows, the seasons pass away. And the wild geese fly in the autumn sky. But they'll be back someday When I was but a young lad I joined the company I worked the oar boats hauling fur for 10 cents a day I broke my back in the oar boat for 10 cents a day And when you're in your boat Sort of a, it's a mix between just the adrenaline of getting in the boat and going and the excitement. Thank you. And I guess the sadness of, of leaving yeah, family yeah. and friends, but the excitement of being with you know a new family and new friends here. Rosanna, you had a good turnout. Oh, oh man. Yeah. 200 people there with the last name Schick. <laughs> just about. They all had the same razor sharp whip. Oh. Yeah. It's mixed. It's nice to see all the public support and enthusiasm for this venture, but fanfare and whatnot, it's the antithesis of what we're looking for in this wilderness experience. It was uh, getting kind of emotional at the end there. Never had so much family out for myself. My brother's usually the hero, he's the hockey player. So it was a different experience for me. A different experience? Ken Albert Jr. did not know the half of it as he rode away from his place in time and sailed back into history. When these guys did the trips, they knew, they knew, they didn't, they didn't 
like we'd be a bunch of rookies in a boat without a captain. They knew, they knew which way to go on the lake. They knew which way to go on the rapids. They knew, they didn't risk, they wouldn't have risked their, their valuable furs. And you know, it makes perfect sense to me. Like they, they knew what they were doing. And the fact of the matter is we, we were going in blind and that's scary. But that's what's gonna make the show, I guess. But like you guys think about it, would you wanna risk something like that to go to to accomplish something and risk risk your life? Like it's gonna be so dangerous. I just hope no one gets hurt. Day one, problem one, the boat is leaking. Uh, we're, we're sort of guesstimating right now that we're probably taking in about 60, 60 gallons an hour. So we're, uh, we're just concerned about the amount of water and how we're going to end up having to contend with it. But if we're taking 60 gallons in right now an hour, while we're rowing in this nice placid stream, what are we gonna what are we gonna have to contend with once we get out to the lake and we're actually dealing with two foot and three foot waves? Crossing Lake Winnipeg is on all their minds. It's stormy and dangerous. A bad place to be in a leaky York boat. Long's supposed to come out. Okay, spigot works the other way. Pull it up. No, no, it's because you're airlocked. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. The boat is stocked with everything they'll need. The rations are sparse, but period appropriate. And on their first morning, a lunch of bannock and water tastes not too bad. Thank you. Like many things on this journey, this will soon change. We're going to become such bannock aficionados. I like Randall's bannock best. That's <laughs> It is a morning of firsts. First leak in the hull, first 1840s meal, and first time to try raising the sail. The York men must get used to it. They'll use it a lot. The fur trade crew sailed whenever they could. It cut down on the pain of rowing. The mast is made from a small spruce tree. It stands 20 feet. The sail is a 14 by 12 piece of canvas. No one's quite sure how the boat will handle with the wind in its sheets, but all admit, it sure looks good. A country church on the edge of the Red River is their first stop. The crowds are still curious, but the Yorkmen stay away. They're not here to sign autographs, but rather to pay tribute to the memory of a long dead fellow traveler. Okay, we're at uh, St. Andrew's Church on the Red River, and this is the grave of Isaac Cowie, my great grandfather, who was the one who came down in 1867 via the York boat. So, this is his final resting point. I think there's some uh, words to live by on the bottom of your stone there. What does it say? Can't quite read it on. Only be thou strong and of good courage. Good words to live by. Only be thou strong and of good courage. Oh, little message for you. They'll need plenty of each before their journey is over. And, yeah, 
for me, the family connection is really neat because it's the sense of full circle almost, you know, coming to, uh, to reenact and to relive one of my ancestors' uh, journeys. And, uh, and sort of check all the seams again, because some of them have sprung. Quite honestly, I'm a little bit disappointed in myself for not being able to spot the, uh, spotting some of the seam leaks, but you know, we didn't have the weight at the time, so the way the water, the boat was lying in the water, we're, I wasn't really sure. No. Maritz Lunenberg is a man who does not mince his words. He says the boat is leaking too much, and isn't safe. In order to fix it, they must drag it ashore. Okay. It's the afternoon of their second day. Moritz knows his way around boats and has taken charge. He's never worked on a York boat before, but is sure he can repair this one. Our first little bruise here, if you want to look at it. Nothing big. What is that? Oh, no, that's from the rocks from yesterday yeah. on, the, on the shoreline. Yeah. What we hit was this. Yeah. It's coming in right in a joint. Yeah, right here. York boats were made by hand. Almost all of them leaked. This one has a knot hole in the bow, which has caused the problem. No, that's tar. Leave, leave that. But see this? Look. This Moritz also decides to make a few improvements of his own. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know what you could do? You could take another chisel, a nice and sharp one. There's a good one. Spend and do that, that, leave that one alone. That one was redone. There's one uh, further down. We were looking at it, remember? It's all silicone lower yeah, down. Right. See, this one's also no good. You're going to have enough oakum for all this? <laughs> <laughs> you cut that out. <laughs> you just cut that out. We don't want to eat it. Yeah, I can do that. There. There's a little baby. This boat has no captain, and the crew work at their own pace. Like everything else, the group dynamics will soon need some repairs. The tools they've been given are originals from 1840 and work well. In a sense, uh, starting to craft all over again. Chinking or caulking, as they used to call it, was actually a, one of, probably one of the most important trades of putting the boat together because, hey, let's face it, we're keeping the elements out. They fill the holes with oakum, which is like horsehair and lots of tar. But no one's done this sort of work for a long, long time. So they do what sailors have done across the centuries. They fix what they can and hope for the best. Fascinating work of the Yorkman. We just sort of figured, that's it, let's tighten it up, do what we can and hope that uh, whatever happens as far as water is concerned and, and swelling is concerned, that it'll take us up to uh, Norway House and the river. And if we have to take a look at it again, we will at that point. So, but we're off. <laughs> Over the next months, the task of keeping the boat afloat will rest on Marit's shoulders. It will be a heavier load than anyone could imagine. For me, it's it's painful, you know. It's I put a lot of I put a lot of uh, yeah love and care into him, and, and now I just see him, and I just sort of feel like I wish I was a vet and could give him a, an anest, uh, you know, uh, euthanize him and just say that's it. On a Manitoba morning in early July, dawn breaks with the sailor's sky. They're at the edge of Lake Winnipeg, but a north wind has kept them shorebound. Rowing the York boat is hard work, and the nights are no easier. Plagued by mosquitoes, their sleep is fitful. Today's wind is a mixed blessing. It slows their journey, but keeps the bugs away.
1840, the fur traders were paid by the speed of their passage and would probably have rode onward. But on this day, 21st century caution wins out over 19th century courage. Trying to get the boat off the beach and figure out another place to put it so that it's not going to get pushed up on shore again, so that when we do want to leave, we, uh, we're able to. Let's not make a big production out of it. Well, you can try the block and tackle, it's fine with me. That'd be, be an interesting thing to try. So, like, what are we going to do when we're out in the lake and we have nowhere? The only thing we'll have is the shore. Yeah. So we're going to have to learn how to do it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to fur trade vessels, this York boat is average in size and weight. The crew are strong, but handling the boat in the growing wind is not easy. This is a skill they must learn. If they reach the north, they'll move the boat through the rapids by rope and muscle. Paul made soup, potato soup, which is to die for. Better than you get in the finest restaurants, for sure. Check it out, yeah. Thick and rich and hearty. Well, that'll be the German in it coming up. From the looks of it, I'd say we're going to develop like uh, 50 or 60 kilometer hour winds. And you'll start to see it up on the white caps on the lake. It'll start to pick up. And once this front goes away, we're going to end up with a nice, I, my guess, is a nice clear day tomorrow. I don't, I think also there's no, there's no uh, choice really, like, it would be a shame to stay here another day, but if we can't row, we can't row. There's no real sense in rowing 10 kilometers and breaking our backs over that. <clears throat> but I think there's a strong sense in the group that we, we should go tomorrow, but again, that's we have to be kind of wise in our choices of when to go. Yeah, like most efficient use of our energy. Because it's not just the rowing, you got to take down your camp oh, and set it up thing. again. you got to think where you're going to land. Like that here. all takes time. Can you imagine how intimately they knew their, their boat and how well they could do things? They would know exactly how far they could push it because they had to. Yeah. Often, and then they often would have had many accounts of people paying the price for pushing it too far. Yeah. See, that must have been a very particular there goes the guy. Oh, keep on pushing your mule. Burn your porridge. Push. Push with your porridge. Watch ah. out for those. All right, so those oars are going to get sued. <laughs> The distant world of the 1840s Yorkman was not without its rough-hewn beauty. And with the wind at their backs, the first morning under canvas on Lake Winnipeg is passed in peaceful contemplation. How's our balance? Are we off? As they settle in for a lazy day, they have two small chores. Get some breakfast, and name the boat. Who's got ideas for names? Gretchen, 
<laughs> Somebody knock him overboard. Pay no attention to the man in the back of the boat. <laughs> well, back in 1840, this used to be called Rupert's Land. Oh, Rupert's a good name. I like that. Can you like Rupert? Oh, you difficult. just want to be difficult. You just want to be a. You just want to be an individual. I'm not a big Rupert guy. fan either. No. Do you like the Hudson? I mean, what it's about a the great Pemmican? name, but doesn't excite me. The Hudson, because that's where we're going. People will. Yeah. In, like in the show, people will identify with that big time. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, more than they would Finley. I mean, or Rupert. <laughs> yeah, or Rupert. Yeah. The Hudson. Who's for the Hudson? Okay, if we have to go for name Hudson. Yeah, the Hudson. Ken? Well, Ken gets his way, man. What a tactician, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Slide that in. You <laughs> snuck that one in under the sail. <laughs> back there at all, Kenny. I'll just lie call, back man. here and Tell I'll just sail. Randall, you okay with that? Uh, yes, excellent. Name. But Hudson doesn't stick. It is soon replaced by Bob. Beautiful old boat. Day five into the trip and we've broken out the pemmican in its uncooked form. So you know we're into the rhythm of this trip when we're eating this without any condiments or preparation of any kind. To my understanding, it's blueberries, an enormous amount of lard, buffalo meat, and maybe some buffalo fat, I, I think. But uh, I don't think I could tell the audience what it tastes like. <laughs> we're going through a lot of sugar. I think we're just going to eat what we want and see what happens and you know if it, if it turns out that we run out of sugar then I guess we deal with it at the time but right now we're just trying to adjust to the food um, so we could use more sugar potatoes and onions are going through pretty rapidly um, it makes the pemmican taste a lot better to cook potatoes and onions don't the bl blueberries cut through the lard? yeah they give the lard a little blueberry flavor it's like a little it's like a a little piece of heaven in that sea of lard. That's just yeah. no, it's uh, it, this stuff is an issue. I mean, it's it's edible, fried, but in this raw state like this, presumably though, your great grandfather ate this in the York boat. I guess, and that's probably why, to my knowledge, he didn't take another trip on a York boat. <laughs> <laughs> For thousands of years before Jeff Cowie's ancestor arrived, the Cree traders sailed Lake Winnipeg. They called it Mr. Hay Sakagan, the Great Lake, and told tales of its beauty and its treachery. Uh, share with us why you, you think that. I think if we go across, it might be a late night. Yeah, we might be a little bit tired, but we're going to save ourselves an enormous pile of work tomorrow. I mean, if we get around the point of that little chunk there, it's only, uh, what is it, another half an hour or an hour, 45 minutes right to the, uh, well, we're in Heckler. I mean, you guys know how to read the skies better than me. What is this guy telling you? It'll be like, we'll hit the shore, there'll be waves slamming into the back of the boat, and it'll be like, a while until we move that sucker up because we don't it's not like we got rollers prepared or anything like that. We'll have to go out, cut down some trees if we ever even want to think about rollering. And then if we don't roller it up the beach and the the surf uh, takes it along. And it gets sideways, it's just gonna get pounded the bits into the shore. I mean, if the whole group wants to go, then we go, I suppose. But I just, you know, think we need to be very cautious and what's your opinion, Jeff? Well, I think to err on the side of being a little conservative and peek around that corner and see if we can get in somewhere. Lake Winnipeg is notoriously unpredictable, and sailing the York boat in heavy seas takes practice. The boat also continues to leak, and the bailing never stops. Which will take 
take about 40 minutes, or we go that way, which is the great unknown. I think we should go this way. The weather worsens as the storm approaches. The crew cannot make up their minds whether to be cautious and camp, or to take advantage of the wind and sail on. What does the group say? Group six here, waves okay? come on. Take it fast. Taking the island or what? The fur traders ran their boats with an iron fist. On this York boat, decisions are made by consensus. What do you say, Jeff? Full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes. Yeah. The superhero team. As part of the making of this program, the television company provided life jackets for all on board. The Yorkmen of 1840 would not have had any. Their errors of judgment were often fatal. Straight ahead. You want to go to your port? Hi, Captain. There might be some beach in there. Just head us straight. We'll take a look when we get closer. I just think that we should have, I mean, we had a great day, we had a great wind, and we took full advantage of it. But I also feel that we need to also know our own limitations in the day and realize that we have, you know, we have to find a place to, to dock this boat because we can't just dock it anywhere. And we, we learned that today, that we need to take time to stop and, you know, figure out our camp and, and where we're gonna where we're gonna camp. So I think that's just the you know the oversight we made today is trying to get too far too fast. Well I don't know it doesn't look like we've got a lot of options here. Is there any room for a shelter? Okay that beach is not an option then right that means we gotta roll around that shoal right or we go back this way. As the light fades, the sail is stowed, and the search for a place to land becomes urgent. Down she goes. I think you want to go in right beside that rock, that one in the middle. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Port paddle. Who's on up? At nine o'clock, a beach is found, and the crew must quickly decide whether the mooring is safe. But the shore is rocky and the waves heavy. With the weather worsening, the boat is in real danger. Uh, I guess I guess they feel it's too rocky, too gonna be too hard on the hull. Guys say they know of a spot a little further along that uh, might be a little better. We're gonna jump on board. Back on board, the joy of the morning has been replaced by the grinding hard work of rowing the heavy York boat through the thickening seas. Who are we on? There is no training for a situation like this. Survival becomes a matter of experience and luck. Portside, row hard, okay? By midnight, they are lost with only the moon to steer by. There is no possibility of summoning help. Their fate in their own hands. Day one on Lake Winnipeg has lasted 18 hours. And for the first time on this historic quest, exhilaration is replaced by fear. Hey, hey, stop rowing, starboard. Trail your Kevin, OK? Trail your. Right ahead. Yeah, you're a bit far to the right. It's quite a bit harder. Break, starboard. Come on, break, starboard. Haul out.
It had been a harrowing night. Lost on the lake, they were lucky to find this beach. How did you feel about the last two or three hours? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It wasn't my favorite two or three hours of the trip so far, but... I mean, we're gonna get ourselves into situations that we just have to deal with. I suppose we handled it the best we could. I think we learned a lot from it, and I hope we'll take some time to sit and talk about it at some point and just, you know, figure out what we did. In fact, I'm happy it happened earlier in the trip than later. Chaotic. Learning when we should, you know, learning the last wee hours of the day, a bit much. You know, we're like greedy, you know, it's, we just did 80 kilometers and, you know, you've done 60 and it's six o'clock, why are we gonna stop now, you know, kind of thing. We know how hard it is to row, so that was the main reason why we kept on going. It's a good thing that storm stayed away. Yeah, that would have been a, just a killer. Yeah. A close call and a lesson learned. Five days into their journey, they've reached the inland sea known as Lake Winnipeg. Every lake has a tiger's heart, and the seven men and one woman, living as 1840s fur traders, must cross this immense body of water on their way to Hudson Bay. They are only five days into the quest, but already their lives are changing. How are you guys finding uh, having one woman and seven men on this? It's okay. Not a problem. She asked us how like we she, felt. She asked us if it, you know if it bothered us if she was within eyesight and so on. And basically, it doesn't bother any of us, as you've probably noticed. We just kind of carry on as though nothing untoward's going on. So, how are you handling the issues of getting a bit of privacy? Privacy, I think you know. If I want privacy, I just I just walk away. And likewise with the guys. You know, if I'm uncomfortable, I'll go 200 meters away and I'll change over there. But I'm just noticing as I get more comfortable with the group, I'm kind of getting a little bit closer, you know, and I can almost just like turn my back and change my shirt and it doesn't bother me, so. In the late afternoon, a visitor arrives from a world beyond their beachfront camp. He is Jamie Brown, the creator and producer of the project. Jamie is bringing technical supplies for the camera crew and more pemmican for the boat crew. The pemmican is the core of their diet, and like everything else they've been given, it is period appropriate, meaning it's what the York men of 1840 would have had. We've got uh, a variety of derivatives of pemmican <laughs> ready for you. You have a little book when you're done, 1,000 1, ways <laughs> to, be make, to that. cook Let pemmican. Me assure you. Yeah. Yes, and well, you brought more. And I brought, yeah, excellent. brought a lot more. A lot Did more? You really? Pemmican is a mixture of buffalo, blueberries, and lard, and was made for the voyage from a 19th century recipe. After less than a week, they can barely eat it. It almost looks like bear shit. No, it shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> A little bit of this goes a long way. You may not need any more. Yeah, you know, we, we were told, and again, you know, we'll find out what the actual situation is, that you'd need about two pounds a day. Per person? We're per not person. eating that much. We're going we're more for the potatoes oh. and onions. Potatoes and onions. Yeah. And, uh, You'll run out of those, and though. Panic. That's the thing, you're going to run out of the potatoes. you got to try to stretch those a little bit. As Jamie leaves, there is a growing sense they're caught in a time and place far removed from anything they've experienced before. We've got, we had an offer of three more boxes of pemmican, which we gracefully declined. We passed on getting more pemmican? Yeah. I, I know we've got enough to get well past Norway. We've probably got enough for the whole trip. But uh, we'll reassess in Norway House and... Okay, yeah. good. So you figure you got enough right now? No. Pemmican, yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. <laughs> Their journey traces one of the great fur trade routes from Winnipeg to York Factory. If they complete it, they'll be the only living humans to do so. So far, they've reached what's known as the South Basin. They'll get more food only once at Norway House, 400 kilometers north across the unpredictable waters of Lake Winnipeg.
Their boat has been named Bob. Beautiful old boat. And with the wind in his canvas, Bob sails the warm waters with the grace of an early morning seabird. Paul Gosson is the optimist on board. He's a river guide who likes poetry. In tribute to Bob's spirit, Paul writes a haiku which reads, Benevolent wind, sails full and ripe like a plum, a gift from the sky. Maritz Lunenberg is a carpenter who says he too used to write poetry until his first wife, quote, beat it out of him. So he gave up poems and took up sailing. This is, this is my sailing ground. This is my stomping area. This is people I've known for 20, 25 years. All of them very good friends. Hi, Ben! Maritz is a man born two centuries too late. His quick temper and open heart seem culled from the pages of fur trade history. This is where he uh, scattered my father's ashes in November. This is uh, an extremely emotional moment. <laughs> because we'll be passing over the exact spot where we cast them off. Maritz has brought the crew to Gull Harbor for a private ceremony to honor his late father. Hi, Richard. Oh, yeah. Good. Oh. Nice to see you. Special day, eh? Very special day. Looking good out there, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Looking good. Okay. Today is a very special day. And on behalf of Merritt's and his family and Merritt's father, whose ashes we spread from this very dock just eight, nine months ago. I know that he would be very, very pleased. Three weeks ago, the York boat crew were strangers. After today, they'll call themselves a family. I introduced Kevin to Pa and uh, spread some tobacco over the water to, as a gift to Pa, part of what we I learned through Margot, uh, who gave us a sweat prior to our departure. We were in a sweat lodge, and I ran into Pa there uh, during the sweat. And between him and the offerings that we're giving to the lake, I think we're going to do very, very well on getting to our goal of Norway House in as quick a, quick a jaunt as possible. Father, don't worry, mate. Love you guys. See ya. It's a beautiful day. Reaching Norway House will be their first big step but it is weeks away, across a notoriously dangerous lake. It looks like people want to be stopping here tonight. We don't want to get stuck in the same situation we had the other night where we were paddling till about, or rowing till 10 and trying to land and running off beaches and being generally disorganized. It's been a good day. Yeah, I don't think we should push our luck. How was your day, Ben? Oh, it's been good. Lazy days. We're getting away with a lot, I think, right now. Yeah, today's been a pretty good day, hasn't it? Really hot, though. I think I burnt my sun burnt my ears. So, you want to get in the water with me? I'll take that uh, fishing box. But it's a beautiful evening. We hope that the wind uh, gives us a good south or a southeast breeze, so that we can go up through the pipe stones and work the east coast and get to Norway House quicker than we think. Because that's the plan. Okay, we're fired up.
At the time of the fur trade, these waters were plied by brigades of York boats. In 1840 alone, over a quarter of a million pounds of fur was delivered to York Factory, almost all of it by York Boat. The system worked because 19th century Yorkmen had few choices but to row and to row. Their 21st century counterparts have things a little bit easier. It's noon. Does anybody want to take a swim? For Rosanna Schick, the hot days were particularly long. She chose not to swim with the men. However, she welcomed the good weather. One thing I'm really thankful for is the cooperation we've gotten from this lake. Going into the trip, just a lot of people talking about how big the lake is and how powerful it is and what it can do. And I mean, it's taken many lives. When we got to the lake, I mean, it was stormy that very first day. We saw the waves and I mean, it was really intimidating to uh, realize that we had to cross this lake. It's been very, very accommodating. I'm very thankful for that. Hey, I'm not jumping up for that. Rowing, actually, funny enough, seems to be one of the easiest parts of this trip. Moving that big boat with those gigantic oars is one of the easiest things that we have to do every day. Everything else is difficult. Um, and specifically sleeping. The bugs are awful and they're everywhere and you just, you can't get away from them. Sleeping is one of the most difficult things on this trip. You're so, you get to the point where you're so exhausted that you just want to fall down and sleep. But as soon as you do that, you just get attacked by millions. In fact, there's bugs right now buzzing around my ears. And it's, um, it's a real challenge to be able to fall asleep. It got to the point where in a few nights we were getting maybe three, maybe three hours of sleep, four hours of sleep over the course of two or three nights and finding ourselves absolutely exhausted in the daytime. And me personally, I don't think I've ever felt that fatigued in my whole entire life. Day seven, and the boat is 200 kilometers north of Winnipeg. They row at a pace of 20 strokes per minute, about a thousand strokes an hour. Due to the south winds, they've only rowed 30 hours all week. But already, the strain is showing. Oh, there goes my hands. Eight hours of rowing this yard boat. I mean, it was, I only saw it about once every 40 seconds. Must have re-rested for a while. You seem tired today. Oh, it's a long, hot day. The longest day yet of rowing. No current with us, no wind with us. Be the hardest day for us all. In the late afternoon, they reach Loon Straits. The Monkman family has lived here for four generations. They're the descendants of a Scots Yorkman and his Cree wife. You look somewhat different. <laughs> How are you? Fine, thank you. Welcome back. Good to see you. you look different, dear. Thank you. Looking very fit and healthy. I good. trust you don't mind. We brought along our crew of York boaters. No, yeah, that's good. That's yeah. good. Ryan. Jeff Cowie is also descended from a Scots Yorkman, and on Monkman Island, he's treated as part of the clan. Hi. Nice to meet you. I seen you on TV the other day. Oh, did you? <laughs> well, we've heard lots of good things about you. Thanks for this guy here. <laughs> Brian Monkman and Jeff are old friends. They built this home together. Within minutes, a deal is made. Food for labor. Rarely has the idea of chopping wood seemed so appealing. There will be no pemmican tonight. I wouldn't say it's the texture. To eat it raw, well, I haven't even tried that yet. But when we fry it up, you know, it's, it has more of the consistency of hamburger. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
there's just such a high lard content, the taste can be a little unsettling after a while. Because that's what the Yorkman lived on. We've been out for a week and we're already chopping wood in exchange for some other types of foods. Yes. How do you think they sustained it for the 10 weeks, the 12 weeks? I don't know, maybe they weren't as spoiled as we are. They probably didn't realize how much more variety there is to eat. The Yorkmen of 1840 would not have done this. They'd have saved their strength for rowing. The Yorkmen of 2001 should not have done this. They'd promised to stay period appropriate, to use only the food and supplies already provided. Oh, oh my goodness. We have We've died and gone to heaven. This is not pemmican. <laughs> All thoughts of this commitment slipped away with the smell of homemade bread. Our program director, Don Young, was not there to police the York boat crew. They knew what the rules were and made their own decisions. You feel bad? Oh, we'll make up for it tomorrow. Indeed, we will. What you got on your plate there, Ken? I got lots of food, man. <laughs> <laughs> times are good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, times are good. <laughs> After dinner, another discovery. Someone had helped the crew smuggle 21st century food and supplies aboard. Like, we actually, do we need, really need to show this? Oh, yeah, I think we have to see it. We have jam and we have honey. We've got garlic. We have some spices. Uh, pepper. Pepper. Toothbrushes, underwear, and a big feast that the Monkmans. None of this seems to me to be period appropriate to the 1840s. Uh, what's going on? I was taught, you know, what a bad thing cheating is, and I, I, I hate to even use the word cheating. I mean, the packaging looks bad. Uh, it doesn't fit in with what we're doing, but I really think that we're blowing this out of proportion, to be quite honest. I mean, we got bigger things to worry about. Like, this is Lake Winnipeg. We're, we're rowing a 40-foot boat by hand ac across the lake. This is four cans of jam and four things of honey. Like, here, that's here. all it is. And it's uh, exceptionally difficult when you're receiving uh, gifts from people that are very excited about what you're doing. They're encouraging you. They're, they, they feel for you. They in many cases, wish that they were doing the same thing you were doing. We can't just switch from, from our everyday lives to, uh, to the 1840s as easily as, as everyone thinks it is. we can. Um, we're deeply appreciative of the hospitality we've been shown, but I think we're also feeling torn in that we're not really following the vision that was originally presented to us, and that's, that's what we're struggling with right now. It has a bit of an Old Testament feel to it, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot of temptation. Jeff, we, you set out to follow, in a sense, in your, your great-grandfather's footsteps. Would he have had garlic and honey and jam? And oh, I know for a historical fact that he snuck along some jam packs with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't get any flack for that. <laughs> <laughs>the crew has recommitted itself to life in 1840. They stow their gear and leave the contraband food behind. What you have to do, Rosie, is you have to find a place where that bale can go if you're gonna take it out. Can we put anything else here? The temptations of Monkman Island are the first of many they'll face on the journey ahead. under sail, but it seems like we're back to rowing this thing again. The days on the boat are long, the nights longer. With no tent or screen of any sort, they are plagued by mosquitoes and desperately in need of rest. But luck is with them, and Bob soon under sail. The crew, overcome by fatigue, sleep restlessly in the hot sun.
We have a new plan for tonight. We found that last night was such a waste of time trying to sleep with all the mosquitoes that we decided we're going to go in, make some dinner, relax for hopefully a couple hours, and then come back out on the water, maybe row a bit more, maybe sail if there's enough wind. And, uh, and then when we're tired and ready to sleep, we're going to drop anchor and sleep in the boat. <laughs> Not all the crew are exhausted. Rob Clark goes swimming. I suppose my feelings so far are that it's great to be doing this. It, it makes me feel like a kid again, maybe like Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn would have felt when they were doing their adventures on the Mississippi. Um, today, for example, just having a, a bath in the ocean by myself and instead of standing there to dry in the sun, just running along this spit and back for maybe three miles. Um, it just felt wonderful. Taking the lard out of the pemmican and then make a, a roux. It helps stick in the, uh, the soup. Is the pemmican tasting any better at all? I think people are getting used to it, yeah. I think people kind of, kind of don't mind it this way. Um, but that might be a stretch for some people. Like, I don't mind it like this. It's not too bad. It's just really heavy. After eating this all the time, you get a real desire to eat something crisp and juicy. You don't like the heat much, eh? No. <laughs> what do you think of the idea of rowing at night? Well, we kind of had a rough sleep last night, so didn't really crack the whip in the morning kind of a thing. Mosquitoes are pretty brutal. If we have any wind, one guy on the helm, one guy on watch, and a few people sleeping just to uh, sort of take this edge off our, our mosquito plague problem that we're having. Well, we'll try and sail right late into the night. Hope so, yeah. And hopefully right through to the next day mm -hmm. and onward and onward until we're done. Yeah, hopefully there'll be enough of us who, you know, are awake enough to just keep on going. People want to rest, they'll, they'll take a nap. So you're saying you feel pretty good about this? Yeah, yeah, it's different, you know. It'll be exciting, I think. <laughs> I think we got some potential for some fun. If anything, it'll be good if we just get away from the bugs. Make everybody feel good. The fur traders of 1840 often traveled at night. A dangerous decision. No one knows how many boats were lost on Lake Winnipeg. But with clear skies and calm waters, the Yorkmen would have rowed into the approaching darkness. Their lives given over to their helmsmen and their fates. Some of these explorers are some real thrill seekers. So what do you make of the weather, Maris? It's um, calm. I don't know if we're, I don't, I don't think we're going to have any trouble as far as weather is concerned tonight. If we do, we're not going to be too far offshore, so we can always scuttle in. And, if there was any kind of menacing weather in there, we'd be picking up wind. It's, it's not that far away. There's, as you can see, the lake is nice and calm. It doesn't mean that we won't get some weather, but I don't imagine it's going to be that bad. Shortly after midnight, the north wind does come up. A heat storm is building. Once again, they are in danger. Our program director was told to intervene if he felt the boat was in peril. Tonight, he steps in and hands out flashlights to help find a safe beach. will be another night of fighting the bugs. But with the winds growing fast, they're lucky to have found a beach at all. Wind came up fast, then? Eh? Very. Very. Good thing we found this beach as well. Yes, very good. Yeah, I think it's a good idea in theory about sailing at night, but, you know, this shows you the practice of it. It's a little more problematic than that.
In the hard light of the next morning, even simple pleasures are frustrating. What are we going to do to get some sleep? Well, we're definitely going to build some kind of structure that we can we can put a smudge in, and that can hold the uh, hold the smoke a little bit, smoke out the, the mosquitoes. I mean, the Aboriginals did that. This morning, I was talking to Jeff, and he raised the possibility of maybe the voyage not being completed because of the exhaustion level. Yeah, well, that's totally a possibility. I mean, the bugs we're facing right now are 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 quite less than what we can expect on the Ichimamish and on the Hayes River. Right, so we'll obviously have to solve this bug dilemma mm -hmm. before we get there, otherwise... Hugely, yeah. We're also, yeah, you know, we're in trouble of not finishing. It is the afternoon of day 13, and another night of misery looms. It's crucial they come up with a plan. Take a wigwam and just run the, pull the uh, willow branches over like this, then plop the tarp on, we can put the fire in, and then people just sleep like a spokes in a wheel with the fire in the middle. Same, same concept as just a freestanding A-frame, right? Close it right off. It sounds quite hot inside. You could put the, uh, the flap right on the crosses of your, your A-frame. How long do you think? Do you think Eventually, need? they opt for a smudge tent, which is an A-frame design with one open side. Rob Clark does not think it will work. He has his own idea. I think our tolerance for heat and claustrophobia vary quite a bit. So some people will probably manage just fine in something like that. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get much sleep in it. So, yeah, I know you've been working on this for a couple of days, and you have limited success so far, right? Well, the first night I slept about four hours, and the bugs were pretty bad, and the others didn't sleep well. And then last night I didn't sleep at all. You're going to work on this, but the others are going to be working on that. Is well, this not a dangerous uh, precedent? I think uh, if this works out, everyone's going to want to do it. How important is this thing we're trying to build here? <laughs> I think it's pretty important. <laughs> oh, we have to solve this problem because I know personally, and I'm sure everybody else feels the same way, that we can't keep going with the amount of sleep that we've been getting. York boats always carried a waterproof tarp to cover the cargo and protect the food. It makes an ideal tent if, of course, there's no need for the tarp. We realize that the shelter is the biggest priority we have right now. We need a shelter more than we need a boat tarp, so we have to cut it. I can't see the Yorkmen doing this. No, neither can I. I'm sure they've probably had something that was already done. These guys are coming from Orkney Islands. They're Scotsmen. They don't even have mosquitoes over there. Could you imagine what they must have had to put up with when they came over here? The key to the design is the smudge fire, which will create enough smoke to keep the bugs away, if the wind is in the right direction. No one has actually done this before, but they've read that it works. If the smudge tent fails, a couple of other prototypes are also being tested. They really won't get under here, because unless you could flare out the bag so it went over your shoulders. Um, yeah, I don't know, this might work. Is this a sign of lack of faith in the tent? <laughs> <laughs> the elephant man. It is an evening of desperation. So Ken, how do you think the Yorkmen would have felt with a bag over their head? Oh, they probably would have said, finish me off and dump me in the sea. Uh, you can go that way down there then. We'll all move up a bit. I think this is the best hope yet. I'm counting on at least two hours of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you want to uh, have a rotation of staying awake or you want to just hope that somebody wakes up as the fires are going down?
The next morning, they sleep until seven. The battle with the bugs has not been won, but for the first time, they wake in daylight with sleep in their eyes. Good morning. How was your night, Randall? It was excellent. Uh, started off on the uh, on the sail outside with the cool wind and the cool breeze. Kept the bugs at bay for a bit, and then we uh, sort of the wind died down, so I uh, woke up and uh, helped Kevin actually, who was also up. Uh, we just stoked the fire, threw some uh, some greenery on it, get a little bit more of a smudge going, and then hopped in the uh, the tent. So the tent worked really well. I think so. Yeah, absolutely, the tent worked really well. All great lakes have spirits of their own. Lake Winnipeg's has been gentle so far. Despite this, the transition to another place in time has not been easy. But slowly, they're becoming more comfortable with life in 1840. Hmm. Today, while we were rowing, uh, Kenny sat in the bow and sewed his little face off for about eight hours in order to finish our tent. So come around here, I'll show you what he did. This was the missing wall from last time, so now we have a four-walled structure. Um, we had debated about whether or not we would put a door in this wall, but what we decided to do was just to keep it enclosed. And rather than make a door, we would just go in and out under one of the side flaps until we're all inside and then uh, close it up for the night. And we also have a very strict rule, but once you're in the tent, you're in the tent for the whole night. There's no leaving for anything. So Ken, are you proud of your creation? Well, see how it works first, and I can be proud tomorrow. Not completely bug proof. There's another one, but we'll have a little bug killing session before the night begins. As the days pass, there's a growing sense of the richness of their new lives. The wilderness seems embracing, not hostile. Their quest, attainable, not impossible. The great explorer, Sir John Franklin, once traveled by York boat. He described his passage as unending toil broken only by the terror of the storms. His survival was due, in part, to the design of the vessel. They sail well in heavy seas. York boats are steered by either a rudder or an oar. It's gonna be hard with that oar. On this day, Randall Shore is learning how to use the oar. You only have so much range. He's soft-spoken and shy, and the crew treat him like a young brother. Randall's doing well, but when the wind comes up, it's a losing battle. I don't mean that way. With the throttle. Use it, use it like a throttle. Use it hard. Don't be shy with it. Something that I find uh, interesting and sometimes frustrating is, is some people are, are much, more, much more vocal and much more uh, just very opinionated and one-sided in, in that sense and really don't, aren't open to, uh, to other people's ideas and, uh, and, uh, and really almost it's their way or, or no way. I want that stupid bow turned around is what I want. Okay, do the war thing there, guys. It's either that or we ditch the sail. Do it quick, do it quick. Moritz Lunenberg is a take charge type with little time for bruised quick. feelings. He's taken over the helm and fights the wind. Everyone, get it in there. But without the rudder, the boat flounders. It's gonna be really hard with the waves, eh, Kevin? Kevin Mustard wants the rudder on and says he can do it. 
but it's awkward and heavy, and in the rolling waves there's a real danger his hands will get crushed. Okay, bottom's on. There. Yeah! Oh, right. right on. Where's the crack? Where's the crack? Kevin's gamble pays off, and with the rudder firmly in place, Bob takes flight. <laughs> this is great. Boom. All of a sudden, we're doing twice what we can roll. This York boat is finally doing what it looks like it's Rudy, Rudy likes to do. And uh, we're pulling almost eight knots right now, I think. If we hit a rock at this speed, that, that rudder's gonna be just flying off. We've seen the movie Far and Away. Tom Cruise has to teach Nicole Kidman how to wash. You plunge and then you scrub, you plunge and you scrub, and if it's not clean, you plunge and scrub again. Well, that's what we're doing. Without Nicole Kidman, though. Well, <laughs> that guy can always dream, right? As you can see, much to my chagrin, I still haven't figured out the straight razor. Um, can't seem to get it sharp enough. I think we're all getting a little tired of uh, the kind of the buildup on our teeth and uh, the battle against uh, trying to stay reasonably clean. We're pushing the two and a half, three week mark, which is a significant amount, significant amount of time away from loved ones and, and family and stuff. And um, I, I guess I'm starting to think more and more about them, but. Uh, well, they'll survive, and I'll survive, and uh, we'll all be stronger for it. Morning. Good morning. And how did you sleep? Oh, it slept really good. Yeah. Does it look like we've solved the, uh, the bug dilemma? Is I the think tent working? Yeah, the tent's working great. There were no bugs the last three nights in a row, but a lot of sleep talking. Not too hot? No. no. It gets actually cool about three, two or three in the morning gets cool and you want to uh, cover up, so it's nice. Okay. Day 17, and another reality of life in 1840 disrupts their peaceful morning. Not good. Our nutritious stomach. Uh. That's mold. What's, what's the problem with it? Sweet. Mold. How much? No, it looks like just about all of it. Times are going to be tough now. <laughs> It'd be hard to treat that. Yeah, we may have just invented a new antibiotic. <laughs> well, what else is there to eat other than this? Well, we have notes? another box of pemmican, and it looks like most of what's underneath there is all right. Like, there's stories about people finding caches of this stuff that's 30 years old, and, and you know, somebody tastes it, and it's still fine. And whether I don't know whether. See, like inside there, it's probably all right. We haven't checked them for a while. We have a small box that we transfer pemmican into, and then we access that every day. So we don't go into these boxes maybe every, you know, four or five days we're in there. It was uh, one of the trade-offs that we made when we made our waterproof tent. That tarp was uh, one of the few waterproof ones we had, and it was designed to cover the whole boat, which would have protected our that food. wouldn't have prevented the water from coming from the bottom. No, not up from the bottom, but we could have packed the boxes higher off the, off the bottom deck. Getting to Norway House has taken on a new importance. Fortunately, the fair winds continue, and the distance lessens as reliable Bob sails relentlessly north. Soon, the 21st century returns. It's my dad, Ken Albert Sr. They're offering us food. No, no food. <laughs> <laughs> right 
After much discussion, the program director relents and allows limited trading, as the Yorkmen of 1840 might have done. All right, this is just Bannock, though, right? Yes, Bannock. All right. I think Bannock's allowed. Wonderful. What about oranges? No oranges. On a brilliant morning in late July, they reach the crown of Lake Winnipeg, where it narrows and becomes the Nelson River. Ken Albert Jr. has hunted moose here all his life. He's the only one on board who has rowed a York boat before this trip and is proud to be coming home in one. My house is a, a Cree nation of about 3,600 Han Reserve band members. It's a, it was a very important part of the fur trade. Some people call Nori House unofficial capital of Manitoba during the fur trade. A lot of rowers that did the work for Hudson Bay were from Nori House. They rowed the boats, they carried the goods. They're still important today. We have a celebration called York Boat Days, just a celebration of York Boats. And it just keeps uh, the history of the York Boat living on. Preserving that history is important to the people of Norway House. The arrival of this York boat shows there are others who also have not forgotten. Yeah, I'm just thinking this is really interesting because uh, it would give us a, a sense of what it must have been like to be part of the York boat brigades with a collection of York boats all approaching the community. It's really interesting and I think uh, you know, it's the first experience we've had with that so far. I'm stoked. Again. <laughs> it just won't go away. They have taken 19 days to reach Norway House. The boats of 1840 would have arrived in about half that time. Their crews would have resupplied quickly and rowed on. This crew receives a hero's welcome. The celebration honors not just their arrival, it also respects the memory of all the other Yorkmen who passed this way not so very long ago. That's quite a welcome, eh? Wow. Oh, yeah. Very. Everybody. All of you guys here, right now. Thank you very much. From the crowd, Larry Duncan, their rowing coach, emerges to share the moment. But the exhilaration will not last long. The tears of joy will be replaced by those of frustration and pain. They have conquered Lake Winnipeg, an achievement that will be made insignificant by what lies ahead. Beneath the Manitoba sky, an age-old vessel rose relentlessly towards the land north of summer. This is a fur trade York boat on its way to Hudson Bay. Day 19, and the crew of seven men and one woman have reached the Cree town of Norway House. 200 years ago, York boats were common here. 
pretty good. I'm happy. Happy, happy. It's quite a big deal for me. Big deal. <laughs> I'm stoked. Again. <laughs> it just won't go away. Today's festival honors the crew for attempting what no living human has done, taking a York boat 1,200 kilometers from Winnipeg to Hudson Bay on one of Canada's great fur trade routes. The uh, amazing welcome that we received in Norway House, they rolled out the red carpet for us. Uh, there were a few hundred people there waiting at the fort to greet us. Uh, we had lunch with the village elders and heard from them. They prayed for us. The village elders treat the Yorkmen as respected guests. Memories run deep here. Only three generations ago, men of different races turned fur into gold. Sometimes at a terrible cost. Many of those fur traders lie in lonely graveyards like this. MacDonald and Osborne, Mowat and Bear. Names from a time when men made their mark by reading weather and running white water. On this summer's evening, three New Age York men pay their respects. There are no lessons to be learned in this field of the dead, just a warning to be heard. A Yorkman's life is short and dangerous. Beware. When they leave Norway House, they'll travel the Nelson River to their first portage at Sea River Falls. Once they cross it, they'll face the beaver dams and swamps of the Etchimamish River. Then, the real test on this leg of the journey, dragging the one-ton boat through a kilometer of thick bush at the Robinson Portage. Three weeks into the quest, and so far, it's gone well. But the crew is about to face a new set of challenges as the river turns to stone. Ahead lie the portages. In 1840, the York men might have run this channel, not this crew. They'll portage it. This will mean pulling the boat across the rock to the next water's edge. First, the four tons of cargo must be moved. Um, it's not that it's too heavy. If you get it balanced, it's really easy to carry, just the boots are really slippery. So you have to watch your footing. Be very careful because I'd hate to fall with one of those on my back, that would hurt. We are uh, <clears throat> in the process of uncoiling uh, 600 feet of three-quarter inch manila rope uh, and it has a set of blocks on both sides whereby we will achieve four times the pulling power of let's say manually just grabbing a hold of it so for every hundred feet that we're going to drag it we have to pull about 400 feet of rope so uh, based on this portage we're looking at setting it up possibly twice in order to drag it across the rock, up this little hill and down to the other side. Use your legs to do the pulling. Yep. So you, you squat and you pull with your legs. The York boat team are both ordinary and extraordinary. In search of a common history, they're attempting a heroic quest. Inch by inch, curse by curse, they struggle to move the York boat from water to rock, from present to past. Never before have they faced toil like this. 
and it will only get worse. We had a rough portage Sunday at the Sea Falls and uh, got our first taste of a portage and it was, uh, needless to say, it was ugly. Twenty-four hours later, the boat has moved 40 meters. The joy they felt at Norway House is gone, replaced by the grinding hard work of the portage. 19th century crews often traveled in brigades. 10 or 15 men might have lowered a York boat down a slope like this. There are only eight on this crew. Maritz Lunenberg knows his way around boats. He has the fiery spirit of a man who won't back down from a challenge. Hang on, Paul's not ready. This thing's gonna have to be really tight. Paul Gossen comes from Mennonite pioneers. He's wiry and strong and tackles tough jobs with humor. Just stay away with that camera, you know. Let's go. Maris, what did you learn about portaging? <laughs> it's a, it's <laughs> portaging is an ugly, brutal, brutal like wherever possible. Of uh, yeah, we also learned that she takes a beating on the on the portages. This first portage has not gone well. The boat has been damaged, and they're still not working as a team. They must get wiser, fast. 33 more portages lie ahead. Five hundred kilometers north of Winnipeg, the York boat has reached the Etchamamish River. Paul? Yes. What do we know about this river and the fur trade? Well, we know that it, this river is the most important part of the whole journey because without it we'd have to take a secondary route that would be more dangerous. The Ichimamish allows you to go from the lake and the Nelson to the Hayes. Much of Canada's early history took place here. It is a fur trapper's paradise. This year the water levels are high, the swamps passable. Two centuries ago, about 80 York boats a year came this way. The land has changed little since then. The return of this York boat as natural as the return of spring after the long winter. We are, uh, I'd say about uh, 10K into uh, the Etchumamish, and uh, we're at Harry Lake, uh, just about halfway through. And we're looking forward to the next couple of days of, uh, of being on the river. Uh, rowing the York boat and uh, and seeing what we can do at the beaver dams and hopefully getting over those with uh, with ease. That'll probably be our next big challenge is, is the beaver dams. Um, you know, rumor has it there's been 25 in, in last year and uh, the water is quite high so hopefully that uh, will eliminate some of them. But we never know and, uh, and we'll have to find out tomorrow. For the fur trade crews, the beavers and their fur were a blessing. For this crew, the beavers and their dams are a curse. Somehow, they must get past them. Never. There will be no apologies to beaver lovers. Beaver have this fixed in a day.
push and pull, stress and strain. Bit by bit, the York boat is levered over the dam. I think this area would have been completely trapped out. I don't think there'd have been any beaver dams along here. 80 York boats a year going through here. They wouldn't have left anything standing in the way of beaver dams. In Isaac's book, is there any reference to beaver dams? Jeff? I think they said the company had to maintain some of these dams to keep the artificial water level because the beavers had been trapped out. Jeff Cowie's great-grandfather, Isaac Cowie, traveled here in 1867 and left behind a diary. The Etchy Marmish is a stream through a great narrow marsh. Only an eyewitness can imagine the exertions of the Orkney men and its navigation. Jumping into the water to lift the boats compelled them to remain the whole day in wet clothes. The dams were the work of beaver. A crew could not be restrained from slaughtering these engineering animals. Orkney lads, like Isaac Cowie, were hired by the Hudson's Bay Company because they were, quote, cheaper than the English, less quarrelsome than the Irish. Contracted for five years, they were paid six pounds a season. Many, like Isaac, met the challenges of this hard land and made it their home. My interest in uh, following my, the footsteps of Isaac Cowley, my great-grandfather, that because it's really been, a, I think, a remarkable opportunity to retrace one of my ancestors' paths and, uh, in a sense, uh, relive a journey that uh, he took over 130 years ago. Two days on the Etchimamish, there is one last slough to cross. The method is simple. There. Row hard, then row harder. Keep going, keep going, keep going, right through. Right through, right through. <laughs> Third time that's happened. All right. <coughs> we did it. Oh, wow. <coughs> <coughs> I think I swallowed another bug. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think I just opened up the scabs in my rear end again. <laughs> the humor is a tonic in the face of what lies ahead. Soon, the river will end and the dark forest close around them when they reach the Robinson Portage. Day 25. With the beaver dams of the Etchimamish River behind them, the York boat makes good time. Without noticing, they're spending more of their precious luck. Painted stone. So yeah, we got through the Etchimamish quite fast, and now this painted stone portage, it's, it's a neat place. It's, uh, it feels like a very magical place. Um, Historically, I believe it was a meeting place and a ceremonial place for uh, some of the Aboriginal people in the area. So it feels, uh, it feels like there's a different kind of energy here. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it's just very calming, it's very nice. Uh, tell me the story of this portage here. Why is it called? Painted stone, and what is the history here? Well, as far as I understand, there was there used to be a Manitou or a, or a, a stone altar of some kind mm -hmm. that the local Aboriginal people worshipped that. And uh, I read I read too about uh, an altar uh, where the Cree rowers would make offerings, give thanks, mm -hmm. and that altar was um, ultimately destroyed by some of the white mm -hmm. traders because the uh, Aboriginal people who moved through here in the employ of HBC would worship at the site for several days and um, that was kind of preventing the easy flow of commerce according to the traders at the time. There goes. 
guys. For 19th century Yorkmen, time was money. Christianity and commerce drove them forward with a ruthless yeah, determination. There we go. Hang on. Hang on. There he comes. Hang on. Oh my God. That's another fucking floor. That bar. that side too crushed. It was my suspicion. Holy. Hit the end of this Both the sides rail. were the rail ends. Right through the boat. Both sides. This is not a sinking of Bob. This is the wrecking of Bob. <laughs> this group of Yorkmen call their boat Bob. Beautiful old boat. And right now, Bob is hurt. The pine rollers have punctured his midsection. Oh, right there. That means we broke the rib, too. The rail works really well for skidding the boat, but it's also very dangerous for the boat, as we're finding out. Once again, it's Maritz Lunenberg who will supervise the job of fixing the York boat. Good. Yeah, the uh, punctures have been fixed up thanks to Maritz's ingenuity and uh, We've got the roller system working fairly well here, so it's just a matter of not puncturing the hull again in the remaining 10 yards, and we'll be off. In less than a day, the boat is relaunched. They have achieved another small victory. The past is a foreign land. The crew of York men are strangers here, yet they are adapting. Four weeks into the quest, their bodies have grown strong, and they're anxious to make a mark as Yorkmen. Soon, they'll get their chance. This is Robinson Falls. The great explorer, Sir John Franklin, was swept down this channel in 1819. He barely survived. The Robinson Portage is where York men come of age. So you know this portage, right, Paul? You bet. Tell me about it. Well, it's long. It's uh, 1,350 uh, meters. And so that means each time you bring a pack over, you're just doing under three kilometers. So uh, we're going to have to be very efficient with how we carry things. And that means Bob is going to go just over a kilometer. How, you? How does it look? It has a few down trees, but it seems to be a lot of good rollers. Like, we definitely cut. It's <clears throat> wide. It seems to be fairly wide, it's at least as far as we got. A little bit wet in some spots. Yeah. And uh, way too many bugs to go walking at night. Did you go to the end? <laughs> no, no, no. We only made uh, it, I don't was... know, 50 yards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bugs <laughs> drove you back? Yeah. Yeah, for now. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us and for all your bountiful blessing, for your majestic creation and for this uh, food that you've provided for us. We just ask you to bless it to our bodies and continue to protect us in our boat. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Day 29. The wild harvest from the Manitoba summer brightens their morning and sweetens their oatmeal. It is a good start. Randall, you got the, the color that just kicks butt there, eh? Come on, take Bob today. I do, I do, I do. Before we scatter off taking all the gear and that sort of thing, I think there's still lots of things that need to be done, like okay, who's going to cook for us? Identify, cook? Yeah. We need an unload, two unloaders and then carriers. So, but you think the portage is uh, just hard work, but quite doable? Yeah, I think it's just the just a whole bunch of work and uh, like there's no danger involved really like it's just work eh? elbow grease yeah, that's all this used to be the uh, the point of honor portage for the novices they would have to take their load of 200 pounds at a trot to the other side come back until they completed carrying their share of 
their load, which was 1,200 pounds. Isaac steps, he took the oars, I have taken the oars. <laughs> it comes full circle. Weird, eh? Yeah, what's so where did the wheel come from? Well, we think it's from the old tramway. That would have been here. From my understanding, sometime in the 1800s. I'm not sure exactly when, but... At the end of the trail, a remarkable find. A 200-year-old set of wheels. Many York boats once passed this way, oh, yeah. and a small railway was built to move the cargo. Totally. Yeah. So Maritz Lunenberg has a plan. Use the wheels to build a cart and roll Bob through the bush. Like this, bang, okay? This becomes the extra bushing. This thing stays in here, this thing rides on there, it can rock. And then on the top, we'll make a flat, two flat mating surfaces which we can lash together. Yeah. And in the back here, same thing, I guess, yeah. so that it can rock a bit. It's got a bit of a wow on it. A uh, huge team effort over the last couple of days. Uh, today, uh, we just finished getting all the, the rails. This is a patented Yorkman's rail right here. Uh, 45 feet long, nice uh, pine, doesn't have any knobs on it. And then we've got uh, these uh, lashed on cross poles and they're going to become uh, the base for the crib which Schmaditz designed for the boat. And everybody else worked on this beautiful sort of wheelbarrow structure that we're going to put on the bow of the boat. Uh, took all eight of us to figure that one out and uh, hopefully it'll work. It's taken two days to build the cart, and Bob is still not out of the water. The Robinson Portage was notorious for the toll it took in human lives. Broken bones and perforated hernia were common. Many died from the strain of the work and were buried in unmarked graves. Good. That's good. 19th century travelers feared this portage. They felt the spirits of the dead lingered. falling tree and and if you can believe it Bob saved my life and you think about how you can be killed in life and think about rapids and bears mauling you or just dying in traffic by the tree it's pretty pathetic but uh, you know you don't have too many life or death experiences in your life and this was one of them and it's good that the boat played a part maybe it'll draw me a little closer when we go through the It is their fourth day at the Robinson Portage. The York boat has moved 300 meters. A thousand more lie ahead. Try the carriage off the axle. The cart is not working. Building it, a waste of time. Their frustration grows. The whole thing's coming off, the whole, except for that front. Uh, we're finding that the wheels are not turning uh, evenly, going, it's wanting to go to the left every time, so okay. we're just taking the wheels out right now, okay. out of the carriage, and it's just going to skid along the logs. Oh, that's it. Enough. <laughs> no, no, I want to talk about it for three more hours. No, I don't want to fucking talk anymore. I'm done talking. Finally. Yeah, finally. No living human has faced a task like this. 
It is the definition of toil. How's the cart working, the wheels we brought back? Well, the wheels have been thrown back to the 1840s. They didn't work. They were hindering our progress rather than helping. That's too bad. Yeah. The cart looked good, though. It looked good, but it uh, lacked something, yeah. So we're back to just the old roller and rail method. Seems to be things aren't going as well as they were yesterday. Uh, could be a lot of things that are accounting for that. But. We've been here four days. And uh, we got to think of the length of our trip that we're undertaking. We got to get out of here. And we need to experiment with, with ways of, of uh, increasing our speed on this thing. So I thought we made decent progress today, and I'd, I would hate to change things around. It's tempting to try and reinvent the wheel frequently, but every time we do that, there's a lot of downtime while we change things around. I'm all for changing to a new, uh, a new way of doing things, but don't discount the realities that are there. Like Randall had a good idea that maybe we set another set of rails underneath the carriage that we have and then use that as the basis to keep Bob from rolling and then just put rollers between it and rails. If you're gonna say go for rollers, let's all talk about the positive and negatives. I just don't want you focusing on the positives of rollers without forgetting that you need two extra guys to hold it well, up so that you don't need too. anything. Bob will sit flat the same way. It's going to keep those rails from binding on all the crap that's on the on the court dog. Oh, you're actually 16 inch higher then. No, but if right now, right now right you're now we're hitting right now we're hitting right. the trail right. If the spirits of the long dead Yorkmen were listening to the argument, their response was clear. Crossing this portage will only get worse. The hardest part is levering that freaking boat around. Oh. I'm all for the ski idea if it's gonna work. Or, I mean, it, whether or not it works, I'm, I'm into trying it. But we just have to make sure there's no damage itself. Because it can't set us back another whole day. Why don't we get a vote here on what we should do? So who's, who's voting for the uh, skidding idea? Skidding or rolling? Or staying the same? We've got three options here, A, B, or C. We're also getting a lot more open with each other. I think we're willing to, uh, we're more willing now to give our opinions and to voice our opinions and to, uh, you know, agree or disagree with each other. It's, uh, it feels like it's a lot safer to be able to uh, be a dissenting voice if you feel you need to be. And uh, tensions also get a little more raised. So I think from here on in, the next three or four weeks are gonna be very, very interesting. They decide to go back to what they know, trees as rollers. You know, we'll make 10 or 20 feet of progress, and then it's downtime, and then another 10 feet of progress. It just seems to go so slowly. Yeah, these lulls, I can't get, uh, I wish we could just consistently pull the boat and uh, move the rails, but it keeps on getting jammed on, uh, on you know, trees because the trail's only so wide, the boat's, you know, 10 feet wide. It's, widest point with the, the roller strapped to it, so. What bothers me the most, I think, is the heat. It's really hot today and muggy and uh, all these little bugs that you can see swarming around my head. There's no relief from the bugs. See these things? Can you see these? They're just incessant, incessant little bugs. Frustrated. I'm feeling very frustrated with this. It's taking too long. Yeah, at the rate we're going, we're going to be here seven days, and this is... Uh, this is uh, becoming, I mean, I don't mind hard work, but this is, this is stupid work. <laughs> and uh, that's all I have to say on this. It seems to be their objective, is just to fly into your eyes for some reason. There, I got a bit of a pine tree on my head. And, uh, Ken Albert Jr. And like, fights the bugs with an idea an elder showed him. Out of my face. Do you have some out of your face? Yeah. 
Might look like an idiot, but it works. <laughs> look at this though, there's very few in front of my face here. Yeah. Wet and bug-bitten, their muscles aching, their hands blistered. There is talk of stopping. I think if we, like, I don't think we can not work in the rain, you know? I mean, what if it rains like this tomorrow? Can yeah. we? No, we don't have that luxury. I don't think we have that, that I mean, I don't think the York. This is not rain, it's kind of a downpour, eh? The Yorkman would have worked in the rain. But we're not working Yorkman. But that's what you're here for. Well, I mean, this is maybe they picked the wrong guys then. And that'd be like saying we're only going to work when it's sunny out. We work in times other than sun. I mean, if it's pouring and we're not even moving the boat because things are getting jammed. I think if people are cold, put on a sweater. You got an extra sweater. That's what I would say. So would you like to quit? No, I'll, I'll quit when I'm ready to quit. But you're not ready now? No, not yet. Oh, good. You'll know. Personally, I don't see a lot of advantage to having eight wet, cold people it's going to drain our energy and our resources quicker than if we take a half a day to sit it out and wait it out. And if it rains for a week, well, I mean, we don't know that. It could be sunny tomorrow, it could be sunny in two hours. It might rain for 10 days. Like, I just think it's pouring. Which side you want it on? Here. But group wants to work, I'll keep working until I'm hypothermic. After five days on the trail, they have barely reached the halfway point. The Robinson Portage has taught them a bitter truth of the Yorkman's life. There can be no turning back, because there is no way out. Uh, Robinson Portage was physically draining, emotionally exhausting, and psychologically, you know, moving 200 paces out of 1,400 paces, uh, you know, in a full day was just was just, you know, psychologically, you just can't believe it, and it's exhausting. Uh, it was definitely a huge, huge challenge. Day 33, a rare sight. Maritz Lunenberg on the verge of defeat. There's a, not a general consensus, but there's a few of us who are starting to feel a little bit uh, miffed by this portage, not so much by the fact that we're doing it, by the fact that there was a statement made at the initial uh, gathering that the portage would be cleared and there would be logs and rollers available. Well, the portage isn't cleared. The logs and rollers aren't there. Uh, myself and Jeff Cowie and uh, Ken Albert Jr., we're, uh, we're sort of in the opinion that if we want to get this job done, we can't do it with the amount of people we have. Asking for help, I think, is a smart way to do this. And, uh, you know, this obviously wasn't done by eight people in the past, and I'm not sure why we're attempting to do it here. We don't have the trail, we don't have the rollers, we don't have the manpower, and... We've given a really good shot, and uh, I think it's a smart thing to do to ask for some outside assistance at this point. It's only going to be so long before we're just going to say, you know, the hell with it, because... It's crazy. You know, we're, we're ruthlessly beating ourselves to a pulp to get this job done. I notice Merritt is uh, down by the campsite by himself. Uh, he seems a bit frustrated with things. He has a low frustration tolerance, I yeah. think. Yeah, but uh, you're still feeling that we can do this? Oh, yeah. We're moving it along quite well right now, actually. Oh, I'm totally happy. Good. I'm happy most of the time. You, you will probably find that. I may have outward gripes, but I'm generally happy just, you know, to be alive and to be out here doing what we're doing. Oh, I'm feeling peachy. Yeah, ready to get this boat moving. I mean, what are you going to do? got to keep going. I mean, we're almost halfway there. Might as well keep pushing. The boat's really moving well right now, and everyone's working hard. And...
It is a terrible morning. Under the glare of the hot August sun, they fight for every meter. Yeah, give me some slack. Moritz has returned. They need his strength. Without it, crossing the Great Portage will be almost impossible. At lunch, their mood is bleak. Like soldiers at war, their emotions are strained, unpredictable. And another storm is brewing. Excellent. In the late afternoon, they reach a small bog. But only half the group is working. Maritz, Jeff, and Ken have stopped. They complained that the television company, Frantic Films, had promised to clear the portage. Yeah, that thing is all really well. Others did not remember this promise. Other discussion time. Read this portage. Read the time scheduling that's left. And the... Uh, possibility of food problems and the fact that we were informed that this trail was going to be cleared and there would be rails and rollers ready for us and they're not well I think we should look at it one issue at a time I mean can we do the trail or not I mean well of course you can if we have a month or another five days or somebody's prepared to get hurt which is going to happen it's getting closer and closer every time we're running out of energy we're running out of uh, strength like, who's ready to quit on the portage with it's what we have right now? It's got nothing to do it's with matter quitting, of just Paul. calling frantic on it. Okay, well, when you say calling on them, that, that means, means quitting with the power we have and asking other people to go for it, right? It's asking for assistance. We're asking yeah. for assistance on a historical precedent. Like, uh, this morning, we were ready to suck it up and get it done in two days. Uh, Who you know, was? It's a bit, of a, a bit of a hot day today, and it's a bit more difficult, and all of a sudden, we're... We're collapsing. I think. Less than 24 hours ago, we scrapped the skitter, and look how far we've come since we started the rollers. Yeah. So I'm, I'm under the, good, I'm under the impression personally. that we see how far we're at at the end of today, and if we have, you know, like look how far we've come since. I don't this know morning. what the hesitation from the group is in terms of asking for assistance here. I mean, we were led to believe that this would be cleared and ready for us, and I think we've got to wake up and realize we're getting slightly taken advantage of in terms of our goodwill. Well, I agree with Jeff. I believe we're getting screwed around. I think that in two days, Bob will be back in the water. I like the, I like the idea of being able to say that, uh, you know, we did it in, what, six days with just us. It's an accomplishment. We're having a hard time of it, and, and things weren't done totally... It's, we'd have a hard time of it anyway. I know, just let me but finish why are we... no, it's okay. I think we're having a hard time if we were doing this solely on our own, I think we'd continue. But by the fact that somebody said that there was going to be some work done and it isn't, we're ready to just stop. Well, some of us are ready to just stop because it's difficult. You know? And yes, we're tired. Everybody's just as tired as everybody else. And hungry and bitchy. And people are, you know, getting discouraged. But it's not impossible. Okay, well, if you let's... want my opinion, we should suck it up, finish this portage in the next couple of days or so, and complain about it when the trip's over. Uh, I'm tired uh, with all this complaining. Useless, it's so man. negative. We don't need it. We can do it. Go away. No, Maritz, I'm saying by the end of today, we're going to know what we've got left. And if it's only 400 paces or 300 paces, we've already done that today. Like, we could do that in one day. We can finish this bloody thing on our own. After much discussion, the group sides with Maritz and asks that a work crew be flown in. As a group, we feel that we've been taken advantage of in terms of our goodwill and carrying through on a portage that's not in the condition we were led to believe it would be in. Uh, and in return for the fact that we feel we've been taken advantage of, 
the group is going to ask for uh, certain concessions from the powers that be. Okay. The program director, Don Young, had a satellite phone for emergency calls. He contacted the production company with the Yorkman's demands. Shortly before sunset, he returned with their answer. message from the program producers was brief. In 1840, no help would have been provided, and there will be no help now. We should just tough it out and get it done over the next three, four days. Yeah, I think, and I think part of it was that uh, people wanted to get some things off their chest, and I think they honestly feel better now having just voiced their, voiced their feelings. The next morning, they are up at dawn. With determination, they work harder than they've ever known and finish the last 500 meters in 12 hours. Jeff Cowie's ancestor, Isaac, crossed this portage in seven days. He described the courage of the Yorkmen he traveled with as Homeric. Two centuries later, this group of Yorkmen would also take seven days. I think everyone kind of uh, decided to give it a final hurrah and get this thing done so we can get out of here because we've been bogged down here for about a week. So I think the mood of the group is uh, fairly upbeat as we approach the end of this thing. Sunday, but it's lots oh. of energy left, you guys. What's all this whining about this portage being hard? Great relief. <laughs> Great relief. <laughs> it's really, 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 really hard. Yeah. I'm very happy that the boat is very close to being going into the water. For Maritz Lunenberg, it had been a particularly humbling week. Upon reflection, he is graceful. Spirits were down, I'm tired, and I'm going to have to learn to. Uh, to uh, <laughs> To, to rein that impatience in and just uh, sort of go with it and just be cool with it. Crossing the Great Portage is a symbol of hope for the quest. 200 years from their place in time, the 21st century crew can now stand beside their 19th century counterparts as equals. They have earned the right to call themselves Yorkmen and have learned a basic truth of a Yorkman's life. The pain will pass and the beauty remain. The trip has been going pretty well. We had a really tough portage at Robinson Falls. The Robinson Portage is about a mile long. Uh, we spent seven days portaging our boat. We had lots of rain, some storms. A vicious storm as we were about to put the boat in at the final end of the portage. Hello? 
sense of great relief to be out of that place. It was getting somewhat hellish. It was physically exhausting work, so we spent the last uh, last evening and today out on the water rowing. It was just great to be out and finally moving away from uh, that landlocked uh, spot that we had found ourselves for the whole week. Day 36, Hell's Gate Gorge. How are you feeling, Mr. Mustard? I'm scared. Any last words to your boys? Bye, guys. <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> I'll see you up there, down there. Where am I sitting? The journey from Winnipeg to Hudson Bay has been an epic adventure so far. This morning, they're trying their luck at the gates of hell. Today we did Hell's Gate and what a rush. I couldn't believe how exciting it was to direct a York boat through raging rapids. It was, it was so incredible. I can't believe I was able to hold on to that steering oar and move this huge boat that just kind of like lumbered through the rapids. It just it was like a Cadillac. It felt like just split through the waves and crested them all and and uh, it took a lot of force to hold on to that steering oar and and push it uh, where I wanted it to go but um, I'm so excited about what lies ahead in terms of our rapids uh, the many rapids that we have to do and and I'm just giddy like a little kid before Christmas uh, anticipating all the all the fun and excitement but their boat is called Bob it's a 40-foot York boat with a crew of seven men and one woman who are living as 1840s fur traders. 600 kilometers into their odyssey, they have another 600 to go. They left Winnipeg and traveled the length of Lake Winnipeg until reaching the community of Norway House. Then they turned northeast and rode the Echimamish until stopping at the Robinson Portage which took a week to cross. Now, they're at the Hayes, one of Canada's great northern rivers. Many early Canadian explorers passed this way. With its beautiful vistas and killer rapids, travelers described the Hayes as a river of hell painted by the brush of heaven. Days of rowing seem endless. 1,000 strokes, a water break, and then another 1,000 strokes. Constant repetition, broken only by the memories of a life left behind. So Kevin, what would you like to eat? Everybody's been talking about food. You've been fairly quiet. Uh, pasta. Pasta or uh, pizza. I want... Uh, a Mennonite specialty called Vereniki. Think of a pierogi and then make it so tasty you want, you can't get enough of it. <laughs> it's bigger, doughier, it's got cottage cheese in it. Randall, I'd like a thick, juicy clubhouse sandwich. I'd like an Indonesian rice table. Satay, Bobby ketchup, oh, gado gado, yum, yum, yum. Nothing better than a chocolate banana milkshake. 
Grand Marnie double chocolate cheesecake. I'd like a variety of assorted vegetables, sort of stir fried sauteed with chicken and shrimp in like a Thai sauce and then spread over some noodles and a big glass of milk and some cheese and a Tim Hortons coffee. Go baby! Double double! She's on a roll. <laughs> No pot of gold under this rainbow. It will be pemmican for eight later. No matter the time or place, life has its routines. In 1840, the Yorkmen cooked twice a day, oatmeal and tea at dawn, bannock and pemmican at dusk. For the 21st century Yorkmen, the campfire was also an important ritual. A time of renewal and revelation. I committed my life to Christ when I was uh, a teenager, <clears throat> and I guess it was confirmed after that that in a miraculous way to me that God really cared about me. One of my legs was uh, shorter than the other by about an inch and a, and a quarter, and uh, I went to a, a service where a, a Actually, I think he was a businessman from Seattle, but he had to lay uh, ministry and healing. So uh, I went to a service where he was uh, speaking, and then afterwards uh, people came up um, if they felt they needed healing. And um, God miraculously healed my leg. It just lengthened in front of my eyes. It's got a warm, tingly feeling. And he had me jump up and down on it. And I guess it was just kind of a confirmation to me that God cares about me and that uh, he still does miracles. The journey is taking its toll, even on the ever-cheerful Paul Gossam. I got defeated in the kitchen today. Just too tired. I shouldn't have been in there. I was too tired and uh, uh, negative mood. So I couldn't make the pan do its magic. It's unusual for you. Yeah. I don't know, I just get in moods like that and everything comes out sour. But uh, unfortunately, we've got a good crew. They're not too bad, Paul. The brutal quest comes as no surprise to Jeff Cowie. His great-grandfather traveled this way by York Boat in 1867 and left behind a diary. It was also the track upon which a novice had to undergo the ordeal to qualify as a first-class tripping man by running without a stop with a load of 200 pounds on his back from one end of it to the other, and repeating the round till his share of the boatload, 1,200 pounds, had been carried across. It's day 38, and we, uh, we're all feeling pretty tired, exhausted, cranky, um, everybody pretty much reaching their limit. So we decided that, um, we would take a day off. And fortunately, we woke up this morning. It was a beautiful, sunny, hot day. We had a gorgeous campsite with rapids. You could put a life jacket on and float down. And um, we did a lot of really, it was a soul day. I like to think of today as uh, being a day that was good for the soul. A day for the soul. And for the first time in over a month, a day to rest. Kevin and Merritt were up uh, about five minutes before me. I uh, bathed, washed some clothes, and now I'm uh, doing some beating, which should take me the remainder of the day to finish. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's relaxing. Probably hold on to it for the rest of the trip on me and then give it to my girlfriend when I get back. With renewed energy, they set out to tackle the haze. The current flows at about eight knots, and the heavy York boat must be skillfully navigated, something Jeff Cowie discovered was not easy. Just 
nice and slow, boys. So what happened there, Jeff? Just to give me the play-by-play. -play. Uh, well, we approached the rapid, and the uh, plan was to do a very hard port uh, draw. The rapid was too strong, and uh, we got swept sideways into a ledge. The steering oar got stuck on the rock, and uh, with the force of the current, it just catapulted me off the rear deck. <laughs> so, a lot of excitement. It's fun. No one's hurt. We got off the ledge, and uh, away we go. Hey, starboard. Are we off the rock? Yes. Jeff was lucky. The accident, a warning. Without an experienced helmsman, someone was going to get hurt. Pull, draw. Pull. Dozens of rapids dapple the haze. Like the knots in a rope, each must be solved in its own way. This set, for example, is narrow and rocky. It's too shallow to run, so the Yorkmen try a dangerous technique called lining. First, a routine they've grown to hate, carrying the four tons of cargo past the rocks. If it doesn't work, we always have the option of belaying backwards and pulling it. Pulling it back up and yeah. portaging it. Yeah. <laughs> That's something we want to do. Lining the York boat means securing the bow and stern with heavy ropes, then easing the boat along the shore, fighting the powerful current all the way. Up and up. The lining works. Another skill has been learned. Teamwork and muscle, just what the Yorkmen of 1840 would have used. That was good. Well, that worked perfect. Oh, well. That was cool. Mastermind <laughs> <and> another one. <laughs> oh, fuck, that's great. Yeah! Well done. Yeah. Good job, team. Saved us about four hours. Oh, jeez. York boats have sailed these waters since the 1740s, but they weren't the first traders to pass this way. 5,000 years earlier, Aboriginal tribes built empires here. Wapanapanas, Opichikona, painted stone. The lakes and rivers of northern Manitoba were the water roads for centuries of active trading. The appearance of a new sail on the horizon was a herald. Tradition would soon be replaced by opportunity. The time of gun and fur, fate and fortune, was about to begin. So now we're into the second phase of the trip, which is getting up the Hayes River and uh, to Oxford House and hopefully on to, to York Factory. Uh, our York boat took a lot of beatings when we took uh, took it over the last portage and when we we're lifting it out of the water and trying to manhandle it over the portage it's been flexing and the planks are, are loosening up and uh, when we put it into the water the thing was uh, was um, leaking pretty good and uh, we've been constantly bailing it so you know you really wonder how this thing's going to last uh, particularly if we decide to take it down some rapids which 
given the fact that portaging is so difficult, we might want to be taking that thing down the rapids as much as we can, uh, just to avoid, you know, these portages. Day 40, Oxford Lake. It's early August, and the northern summer is almost gone. The rain falls constantly, and the crew fights swells more common to the Atlantic than Manitoba. Doing good, guys. Moritz Lunenberg is at the helm. He's the sailor on board. With a summer storm approaching, Moritz is seeking a safe harbor. He's coming here, to Oxford House. Once a fur trading post, the village offers sanctuary and food. Beans, bannock, and walleye, a 19th century Yorkman's feast. York boats often sheltered here. Memories of the fur trade are fresh. Three generations ago, Local men crewed the boats. Hi, Tim. Maritz. Welcome. My great grandfather used to travel from Cumberland House all the way up to Bruchy. Uh, I remember as a young kid when he was talking about uh, his trips, his travels, how they'd have to sleep on rocks like this uh, when they'd stop for the night. Every man was expected to carry 200 pounds when they were portaging, you know part of daily life for some, all for 75 cents a day. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? There you go. I'm just charging a quarter. <laughs> the people of Oxford House have prospered. They've built a strong community on tradition and family. Well, my uh, great, 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 great grandfather, William Sinclair, married a, uh, a woman named Margaret Nataway, and I believe there are still uh, members of the community, Nataway and Sinclairs here, so they would be in some way uh, distant relatives of mine at some point along the way. So you're from the Sinclair family? Yes, uh, It's uh, Jeff's family, was uh, Sinclair as well. Was, uh, the first. One of his yeah. uncles has a resemblance, yeah. Victor Sinclair. Yeah. 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 Meet him. My cousin. Yeah. 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 Just like to thank you guys. The 19th century Scots crews who stopped here were bound by five year contracts. This crew has been away five weeks. They are homesick. I'm just finishing a letter to my family. Apparently permitted to send a short letter out from here to home which is the first time. So, uh, just finishing a six-page letter to them. Thoughts of family are soon put aside as the constants of history return. The York boat must sail north, as so many others have done. See you later. As the long journey continues, a transformation is slowly taking place. They are tired and dirty, lonely and wet. They are becoming Yorkmen. Let's just go straight down. Six weeks into the quest, their confidence is high perhaps too high. The Hayes is a powerful river, yet they insist on taking turns navigating the York boat. Once again, Jeff Cowie is at the helm. Okay, get ready for that starboard. They have run aground. The boat damaged, the crew scared. It's finally time to change the way decisions are made. 
total lack of communication. The bowsman was pointing in one direction, and then the steersman wanted to go in one direction, different than the bowsman. And the oarsman had no idea what who to listen to because we're yeah, going. Yeah, nobody was telling us anything. It was just chaos. Yeah, chaos. chaos. And when they do tell us stuff, everybody uses a different word to mean the same thing, and that pisses me off. <laughs> well, no, because we agreed on three words three weeks ago, and nobody can say them. We've got one person in our crew who's far and away the best qualified to read the river, and my suspicion is that he should be in the bow or the helm most of the time from here on in. That's Paul. Paul Gossen knows the river, but it's Maritz Lunenberg who knows the boat. That's, that does, I don't know if I can fix this. That's a lot of water. It's coming in by like 10 gallons a minute or more. It's just broken, that's all. <laughs> Needs to be fixed. If the journey is to continue, they must put aside the anger that flared at the Robinson Portage and work together. So we're here now trying to reassess the situation and um, I think we're going to be here for some time because that boat's got some serious uh, hits. What alternative are we going to have? It's either we shoot rapids and crack it up on the rocks or we portage and crack it up on land. It's, you know, either way it's not looking good for poor Bob. There you go folks, back is broken. The damage Bob has suffered in this grounding is insignificant compared to what lies just a few days ahead. As part of the safety measures for this program, a doctor traveled with the camera crew. Kevin has taken ill. You feel dizzy when you stand up? No. No. Okay, you've been drinking lots of water? Uh, haven't lately. You should really try to make up for your loss in... Uh, in diarrhea with, with uh, oral intake, so if you pee a quart, you drink a quart. Are you in pain? you have any, any abdominal pain? Mm, no. Just feel wiped, eh? Mm -hmm. Your main challenge is uh, to keep up with fluid loss. You know, I like, I like the boat. I like the whole... The idea of, of wood being, you know, manipulated and worked and, and, and turned into a vessel like this and then just watching it get pounded to bits, uh, it just hurts. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't feel good, you know. The first time Bob hit something and punctured him, I, I, feel like I, I felt like I got stabbed and fixed him and, uh, and then we had another one and then another one and now we have this one and it, it's just, uh, for me, it's... It's painful. Maritz Lunenberg is no quitter. While the crew portage the cargo, Maritz fights to keep Bob alive. Uh, a week, but uh, good to go. Kevin Mustard is no quitter either. Despite being badly dehydrated, he's soon back on his feet. It looks like we can do the and Paul nice has run. found a way around the rocks. And I think the most dangerous part is probably going to be that the belay. 
Kenny and uh, Rosanna found out last time that that rope has got so much tension on it, it would just rip your fingers right out of them. They've come together as a team and are underway. This time with the captain at the helm. In the softness of a Manitoba twilight, the York boat nears the end of another 19th century day on the haze. Even with Paul's experience at the helm, running the rapids is like gambling with the gods. Rock and water, luck and skill, the immutable elements of the Yorkman's life. We're just finding a way out of this mess now, but our light is gradually uh, leaving us and we're not in a good position to be attempting to uh, find a channel through here. Okay, we can leave, leave her the back end. If you guys can push like we were doing before, let's do that. doing anything getting ready to row it <laughs> in, an, in an hour and a half it's gonna be dark what do we do when we get out here we gotta are we gonna try to shoot this thing or we have to the only other option is to go back upstream and that's yeah. like not an option okay. just want to go to bed I'm not cooking tonight <laughs> I don't give a crap okay boats go and get in the water get in the boat in the dying of the light, Paul Gossam takes one last chance to get through the rocky channel. Okay, we're good. We're in the clear. Forward. Yeah. Okay, drag starboard. They are safe, and Bob lives on. Later, a centuries-old ritual. They laugh at the dangers of the day gone by without fear of what the next might bring. With hundreds of kilometers of white water ahead, this was how it had to be. <laughs> if you looked at everyone's faces yeah. at the beginning, we're just... Okay, whatever, let's just go. I don't, I don't care if this thing hits a rock and splits in half, or it makes it or what, let's just get going. I know, because I left there and I was trying to be all positive, but the response I was getting was like, I don't know. Trout Falls. Another portage. Well, we're just unloading the boat and uh, pulled out the pemmican from underneath the, uh, the benches. And it was a lot heavier than it should have been. And uh, it's full of water. Bilge water. Bilge water, yeah, not rainwater, not clean water. Water from wherever we've been traveling. The boat is leaking badly and needs constant work. Everybody was expecting that after Oxford House, we'd be able to start moving a bit more, you know? We'd be going quickly. Current's on our side, but just we're learning how this boat works in rapids, and that takes a while. Yeah, people were expecting, I guess, to go a little bit quicker, but um, get over this portage, we'll be on the lake, and we'll be cruising. Yeah, so I think once we get over this portage, morale will go back up again, you know, get some food in our belly, and we'll be fine. Bob's wounded right now. We hope we can fix them again. 
this point? I don't care. I'm sick and tired of fixing this thing and watching it get beat to hell. Trout Falls is a well-known landmark. Jeff Cowie's ancestor portaged here. Well, he writes in his, uh, in his book that they were camped at the lower end of the portage here when uh, a brigade of four York boats was coming the other way towards York Factory. And uh, he writes of uh, seeing the four York boats take this falls and uh, shoot it somehow. And uh, well, here we are, and we're just trying to figure that out. How the hell would they have taken a York boat over this? There's no thought of this crew shooting the falls. Once again, they're back to a familiar routine. As you can tell by the keel there, it looks like we ran into jaws in the river. <laughs> What's your sense as to how the boat has come through so far, Ken? It's going good. A lot better than what we've been doing before. What sort of shape is the boat in? Uh, it's a little rough. Uh, at one spot there has a uh, half a keel out of it, so uh, should be able to limp through though. You know, when do you think we will be into the home stretch? When are you going to take a deep breath and say, you know what, we're going to make this? Not till we see the big white building. <laughs> Not till we get up to York Factory. Yeah. Are you really getting a very personal sense of? going back in time and living a little bit of Canadian history? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think all, I think about it all the time when we're walking along these trails and stuff like that. Um, you're walking on a trail that's been dented deeply into the into the uh, turf. And, then, you know, thinking about, I wonder who walked here 150 years ago. It's, yeah, it's, it's great. There's a fork in the path on the portage path and we take the one that's closest to the water, but there's another one that veers off just early on in the path. So after we finished portaging, I went back and took that other path quite a ways into the woods. I found um, there's an old fire pit just off to the path at one point, and it's all grown over in moss, and, but all you can see is the rock formation, the circles. And I just, I stopped there for a moment and thought, gee, I wonder, you know, who used this and when it was used. And yeah, you can just feel the, the, the life that has gone through this area. The life that passed before was often taken away on this river. In 1840, Yorkmen found comfort in the Old Testament book of Psalms, which reads, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from the waters. The Yorkmen of 2001 believed that they could take care of themselves. Day 47. Once again, they are under sail as the haze widens into Knee Lake. The bilge water is now above the floorboards. They must bail constantly. The dampness has also affected the food. Where are those oats, Ken? There's a bit of mold in them, so they're a bit, they're a bit rough. Yeah, that certainly does taste kind of different. Oh, the mold. Yeah, it's got flavor, Very flavor. Fish. Oh. It's in a white bag on uh, pork and starboard. Did you eat, Randall? No. no. Why not? Uh, I don't know. I didn't feel like having oats for the second time today, especially cold. I'm just not hungry right now either. As the York boat crawls north, the heavy skies follow them relentlessly. The wind is edged with ice. 
Reaching Hudson Bay has taken on a new urgency. Hip hip hooray. Two more weeks. Two more weeks, yes. Chip chip. Jolly jolly. How's that cold of yours this afternoon, Merrick? How is it? Yeah. Well, I'm feeling a little bit stuffed up, God. Yeah, you don't look too good. No, I, I, I have been feeling not the best for the last couple of days. I think I'm just, uh, i just wearing on, just, I think I'm just wearing out. I was having a, a, a time out for myself just to sort of get away from the group because I'm, I'm finding that I need my privacy and uh, laid down in the moss, sort of relaxing. I guess I fell asleep, but woke up with a startling dream, a bad dream, and, uh, it was one of those ones that really shook me awake, and it was the thought of Bob flipping over and capsizing, and either, uh, either Rosie or Randall was going to be in serious trouble, and uh, that was the picture that I had, and it, it just uh, it just blasted me. So I, I just, you know, I talked to Kenny about it, and he says, oh, he doesn't like that, you know, because he believes in the dreams, and I don't normally get dreams like that, so for me to sort of react that way was kind of, uh, yeah. Strange. It's gonna be one of these. Oh! Two weeks earlier, they would have had the strength to portage this rapid. Not now. The crew decide to run it. Unsure as to how, they place their faith in Paul. In 1840, the choice would have been similar. To live or die by the skills of the steersman. Remember left? up the current a little ways. It's not that strong, not as strong as the other day. And luckily we don't really have much of a problem lining up here. And uh, we'll keep into the water. <laughs> That's where I really get into it, you know, where we're rowing and, you know, rowing forward and dragging and dropping. And, uh, you know, the rapids, the big rapids where we just shoot right through. You know, the boat is pretty good just plowing through stuff. And, Unless we hit something, you know, it's not too exciting. Hopefully we don't hit anything. This will be the last rapid of the day. Paul is confident and the crew ready as brave Bob sails into battle with the waters of the mighty haze. Taking run. Bob twists and turns and avoids the rocks. Beautiful. That was our best rapid yet. Oh, it's great. That was fun. That was a hard one. Yeah. First starboard. Suddenly, they're caught in a cross current and carried down another unexpected set of rapids. They struggle to save the boat. The commands Forward, sharp, Forward, desperate. Forward. Forward. But the current is too strong, and the York boat glances off one rock, two rocks, then smashes sideways into a third. Disaster occurs. The boat is almost flipped over. The crew in danger of being pinned beneath. We're sinking! You gotta get prepared for a possible capsize. That fills up and up, it's going over. Bob is destroyed, and their precious cargo lost.
This is how many 19th century Yorkmen died. Their 21st century counterparts are saved by the program's doctor, who uses his Zodiac to ferry them to shore. That was terrifying. I felt myself sliding like towards the water and the gunnel, the water came over the gunnel and I could see the boat like practically right over top of my head and I thought like, this is it, we're going over, we're all gonna be stuck under the boat and all I could think of was get to the top, like the Titanic, you know, you scramble for the highest point. It was terrifying. Well, you wanna know something? There's a hole in the bottom of the boat, this wide and about eight feet long. Oh, really? shit. And the stem post is cracked. Yeah, it's like track. the whole bottom is ripped out of the boat. The planks up the front underneath, they're also smashed. <laughs> That's why the water is gushing in. The star, the port and starboard top strakes are popped. Someone blew the nails out. I'm glad you guys have a fire going. So, uh, so what's, well, is that fixable? Uh, it's important that we get Bob out of the water as quickly as we can because right now she's off of the main rocks we were on before. Okay. The longer she sits in, the more damage she takes. The quicker we get her to shore, the more chance there is of resuscitating her. A lot of pipe dreams here. I can't tell if that look in your eye is determination or resignation. I just hate seeing Something like a boat like that just get destroyed. It just, it just hurts. I could feel it the same way as if it was my boat. Tomorrow I'll bring Bob sitting there with a broken back and busted stem posts and too many planks out and some zealots, dreams of whatever. They are exhausted, isolated and Bob badly damaged. Worst of all, the spirit of the group is shattered. We're not leaving it in a safe spot, that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that Bob is under a lot of danger right now, and I think everybody Bob should know that. Bob is under more danger with that line on it than if he was just sitting on the bottom. You're stressing the hull like snot when you got it healed over like that. You'd be better off just letting him sit. That's what we're saying. Twelve hours of constant stress is gonna is gonna break her further, right? I mean, she's not like made it a rubber. She's not gonna just kind of sit there and take it. I don't care. You guys, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I just don't want everybody to actively just be lazy and not make that decision. What do you propose that we do? Well, I'm saying that like there is a possibility that we could still get it off the rock if that's what we wanted to do. All that's gonna happen is you're gonna lay, he's gonna sit up and sit on the bottom and that's it. But it'll be less tension, right? Less tension, it'll be less tension on him. Well then maybe sitting that's flat sitting flat on the bottom. Yeah. That's a it's half flooded medium, anyway. Right? Water will swirl around it and through it and over it and The morning light brings little comfort. Bob lies dying on the rocks, his hull splintered, his back broken. The Yorkmen of 1840 believed the resurrection might save their souls. The Yorkmen of 2001 would need a similar miracle to save their quest for the bay.
It was the disaster they had feared. Lost on the edge of a wild northern river, a thousand kilometers from home, their boat is in pieces, their friendships damaged. This is their time of faith. Twelve hours earlier, a sudden and terrifying collision sank their York boat. Swept onto the rocks, the power of the impact almost capsized the one-ton vessel. This is how many fur trade Yorkmen died. That fills up and up, it's going over. Just before the end of the rapids, uh, we got we hit a rock very hard, damaged the bottom of the boat significantly, and then got stuck sideways on an even bigger rock shelf, and the boat almost capsized. We had to scramble to get to the upstream gunnels just to keep it from going over. Sir. We're all gathered here today to uh, <laughs> mourn the passing of a loved one. Uh, no, uh, we just got to figure out what we're going to do today. Um, I think we should all uh, just weigh in uh, on our ideas for Bob. Because I think uh, we need everybody's input to get this thing constructively uh, fixed and on our way. What about the, uh, like the safety factor of it? Like Someone could have got hurt there, and we're lucky. It's a good concern for me, and uh, like we, if we fix it, we gotta fix it good. Like how many more rapids we gotta go through? 30, 40? I mean, frankly, I don't want to be in that boat anymore if it's gonna be hitting rocks like that. Like it's that's pretty serious damage. And Kenny's right, we're lucky nobody took the damage. We've always maintained from the start that if somebody doesn't want to do a rapid, they don't have to. And now we know really well what what can happen when, it, when the boat hits rocks and gets run aground. It's really serious. I'm getting a sense that we're really focusing on, on your decision as, as everyone's looking to you in terms of guiding this thing. And you know, I understand your experience in the, in the white water and you're having done the trip and everything. And I think that's very valuable and, and appropriate in the, in the circumstance. But on the other hand, I think we should really be aware that we all need to be participating in these kinds of decisions, and uh, yeah, I know I agree, it's... Yeah. Okay, like in terms of like, I read the rapid, and then I come out with choices, and then, because we can't have eight people reading a rapid right. and saying, I think we should go right. here, and I think we right. should go there, because that wouldn't work. Like, I mean, it's just... It's a, it's One voice option. is missing from the discussion. Maritz Lunenberg. He is exhausted. His fierce spirit finally broken. 7 weeks into their journey from Winnipeg to Hudson Bay, they are stranded near Swampy Lake, about 250 kilometers from York Factory. They still have many more rapids to cross if they can save the boat. Got 3 and a half feet or 4 feet. Oh my. <laughs> That's worse. Oh, that's, that's worse horrible. than I even saw. Six cracked ribs, a loose stem post, a split keel, and two large holes in the underside. Bob, their York boat, is in bad shape. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. The uh, keel's cracked in two, and there's a big hole that we saw yesterday. We couldn't see it today because the boat had turned. But it's a major repair job if it's repairable at all. I, that's something that I really truly believe is that, you know, the only option here is to work on it and then put it back in the water. I mean, it's not like Bob is going to stay here and we're all going to go home. I mean, we're going to find a way to fix it and we're going to put it back in the water and if it floats, great, we'll continue. But the biggest thing here, and this is what um, Rob and I were talking about earlier, it's kind of like the Apollo 13 mission that went bad and they came back, you know, on the power of a battery. I mean, 
you know, we've got eight mines, the tools, and tons of wood. I'm not working on it. He can work on it. You're not going to work on it? No, it's broken. His spine well, Mer is broken. Listen, Merritt. Yes. I've got you on tape telling right. me it's been broken two or three times already. So? So why is this any different? Because this is the spine that's broken, and it's broken in two places. It's basically our attitude will determine how well we fix it. If we're pessimistic about it, we'll just go, yeah, that's good enough because we know it won't work and we'll go home, you know. But uh, if we really put our minds to it and we really try and give it an honest shot, I think we can do it. I mean, we're only 250 kilometers away and sure, we got lots of rapids between here and there, but we'll limp along, you know. Yeah, I, I agree with Paul. I think attitude is critical. If we think we can't, we're right. And uh, all we can do is give it our best attempt and see what happens. Randall? Yeah, I mean, it's just merits has dug us out of a few holes, and now it's our turn to uh, dig the group out ourselves, you know? It's, you know, I would say upset. Maybe this is a good word to describe the way I feel. Just about the condition of the boat once we got it out of the water and, and saw the damage that was, that was on it. Um, you know, just gouges out of the boat seven feet long, and uh, the keel just, just torn to shreds. I feel really bad for, for Merritt, who's put a lot of hard work into you know, getting that boat ready to go in Winnipeg and just the repairs put done along the way. And it's pretty upsetting, um, you know, for the group. Uh, two of them have. These two have been sheared off. They've been moved? Without the carpentry skills of Maritz, fixing the boat is a puzzle. I think they just put that joint. Isn't that just a joint in there? Oh. Yeah, this is where the where the uh, the two pieces come together. Um, so I think we best uh, divide into groups and work on, like the way Randall says, you get a job and you focus on that job and not on what somebody else is doing. Job one is to see how much food survived the sinking. Uh, there's a few bags of flour that were pretty much submerged in the water, but they were, uh, you know, with the flour, thing we're finding is the outside hardens and then everything on the inside of the bag, uh, the inside of the hardening part is still good. So we have to basically transfer the good stuff out of the, out of the wet bag into a new bag. Pemmican uh, has been soaked again and again numerous times. So we just dump the water out and, and then uh, keep on carrying it along and cooking it up to eat. Um, dry it out the remainder of our small stock of potatoes and onions that we have left. Uh, I think we have about eight onions left and maybe 30 potatoes for the rest, something like that. And so we're rationing those. Rosanna Schick is at home in the bush. She has a few ideas on what might help repair the boat. Looking for spruce gum. And it's the, in, the sap from inside the spruce tree. What it does is it uh, comes out of the tree, I guess in spots where the tree has been damaged, and it hardens on the outside. And you'll see little clumps of it like this on the spruce tree. And someone from Norway House, a friend of Kenny's, actually showed me how to find this stuff. This one has a little bit. If you run out of tar, you can melt this over fire, mix it with lard, and you can make a, a substance that's even stronger than tar, apparently. Spruce gum will stretch their supply of tar, and there's plenty of trees for planking. But somehow, the crucial curved ribs must be replaced. Without them, the boat is finished. Yeah. So you center it on the brake? Yeah. You put it Two on right, each side. Put it right beside it. That looks pretty damn good. <laughs> In a moment of inspiration, Rob Clark realizes the staves of the water barrel have the same curve as Bob's broken ribs. And this stave from the oak barrel fits it perfectly. Like, that's lucky. We're incredibly lucky, yeah. It's like the barrel was made to order. Then, a welcome surprise. Moritz returns. His anger behind him, he's refreshed and ready to work. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> Down here, you can see that we're missing two planks. Yeah. Um, is it more expeditious to work on the first plank up here or down there? Down there. That's how it was. So, I mean, that's how they did it. So that's how we have to redo it. Right away. Uh, 
Maritz has a Yorkman's heart, passionate and volatile. 18 hours after the sinking, he's ready for battle one more time. We're doing our best here, but it feels like a gigantic kids project to rebuild a York boat with uh, the materials and tools we have. I think the biggest setback is that we don't have enough tools. We only have a couple of saws and one hammer. I think the, the hammer just broke, actually. <laughs> so uh, there's a few setbacks, but slowly but surely, somebody broke the ruler, the only ruler that we had. So I took a little piece of it that was left and fashioned a new one. I think it's fairly accurate. This would have happened uh, August 1840. What would have happened to the crew? Well, I guess it depends. It depends if they were traveling, as I think they did for the most part in, in a brigade, in which case they would have had the assistance of other boats and other crew members. Um, if they were traveling individually like we were, I, I suppose they would make all efforts they could to get it fixed. And uh, failing that, I don't know. You know, walk to York Factory, walk back to Oxford House, but um, they were on their own back then and, you know, they had to get it fixed or they were walking. For this crew, walking is not an option. Their choices are simple, save the boat or quit. And Yorkmen don't quit. I want it to fit flush here in that hole we can plug. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Two days later, Bob is almost repaired. There's a, some more repairs on the other side of the boat that still have to be done. We're gonna have to laminate some lumber to the outside edge of the keel here to pick up this, to sort of make up the difference for the horrendous crack that we have running through here. Uh, there's a couple of planks on the other side that are fractured, so they have to be patched and, and repaired. And then uh, the whole thing has to be caulked, sealed, Driven by the determination of Paul and the expertise of Maritz, the holes are patched, the seams plugged, and the hull retarred. They have done the near impossible, rebuilding a York boat from pine trees, spruce gum, and a water barrel. I found that I'm, you know, maybe a little bit pessimistic, or not even maybe a little bit. I am pessimistic on some of our uh, endeavors, and, uh, you know, I, I see what's happened with Bob, and I saw the damage, and, and my, my confidence in the ability of the boat to continue on from this point is basically at about 20%. Twenty percent. Long odds. This is what lies ahead. I don't think Bob is safe anymore. Tomorrow, they plan on relaunching. But the sinking haunts them all. No one knows if the repairs will hold. They've seen the crushing power of the water, and it has scared them. Ken, badly shaken by the accident, is having uh, doubts about the entire journey. Well, if we hit another rock and it splits and say it turns over again like it did, or it turns right over this time, or 
if someone gets hurt is my general concern. I don't want anyone to get hurt. And be hard to live with that when, you know, we're just we're just trying to make a, a film. And if this was our lives, it, our real job, it would be different. But there's more of a risk now that the boat is not 100 percent. I'm not a stunt man, and uh, I don't plan on risking. Like I, I'll take some risk, but I, you know, like a serious like. I don't know, like something can happen and, you know, you split your head or you, or you, you're uh, paralyzed or, you know, anything, anything can happen. And... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Rob Clark is a man of faith. Most of the others are not. Yet on this night, in the northern bush, they sit together in prayer. Uh, some difficult sections left to do on the river, and we're all concerned about it. We just ask you to give us wisdom and guidance in the decisions that we make and in the work that we do on it, and prudence in running the river. We just ask you to keep us all safe, protect the boat, and help us to arrive safely and speedily in York Factory. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. A new day, a new beginning, a familiar problem. You know, because if she's uh, really stern heavy, that's a good thing. Because, I mean, the, the rate that this water's coming in, it will need to be bailed, like, pretty much continuously. This is after about an hour and a half, I guess. Hopefully that, uh, hopefully that, uh, sh you know, she'll swell up a little bit and it won't leak as much. But there's other portages, so we'll be able to take her out sometime. We're all hoping that we, uh, that Bob stays afloat and that we don't have any more calamitous situations. And, and uh, yeah, it's nice to get out of here, even if it's just to get out of here. Triangle white, we're going to stay in the middle and... But getting out of here puts them right back where they began, in the middle of a killer rapid in a leaky York boat. And this is... It's the biggest rapid we've done, but I think it's, from what we've learned, I think Bob easily handles big, big waves. There is the possibility that we'll do some damage just because it's a big wave. I don't know. How big is it? Uh, the curling back one? Huge. I don't How know. How big is huge? In, in feet? So Kenny, you regretting the uh, day you signed up for this project? That's it. <laughs> Maybe soon, though. The morale of the crew is as vulnerable as the hull of their boat. Another sinking, and the quest will be over. It is a desperate few minutes. To avoid the rocks, they need a precise course through the channel. Paul steers. Moritz sets the pace. The rest of the crew row hard and hope for the best. Continue. Two days and 50 kilometers later, an unexpected find, a piece of their cargo. I volunteer. Okay, Rob. Oh, you go right, here Rob. and get your wee willy wet. <laughs> Since the relaunch, oh the mood God. of the boat has been exuberant. This solitary bale may be a symbol that their luck has changed. Well done, Rob. 
Where shall I bring it? Bring it to him forward. I'll put it here. Take it to the York Factory, stairs. Rob. <laughs> York Factory? I don't think so. You might have a better chance than... <laughs> well done. Oh, good job. Number three. Is that somebody's lucky number? Bingo! The question is, is how to get up here without tarring my entire front side. The Hayes River was one of Canada's great fur trade arteries, but it was tough to navigate. Is it going to be a question of all of us just getting out and pushing it? Yeah. Probably. They're lining the boat down a dangerous channel. Yorkmen died in currents like this, swept away so that Europeans could wear beaver hats. The crew wear helmets and life jackets constantly. Their hobnail boots have the purchase of ice skates, and they worry about being carried downstream. Also worry about being crushed between the boat and a rock. And Ken Albert Jr. worries about everything. You guys get over on the uh, starboard side? All right? Yeah, I think you guys are stuck right here. Right here. I need a starboard friend. I'll run away. Bob is, Bob is pretty weak right now, and uh, we have to be very careful with Bob. Uh, you can feel him, or I felt it anyway, the last couple of days when we were rowing, I can feel him flex when, uh, let's say, Kenny or myself give a really hard yank. I can feel the boat corkscrewing, so that means that the spine isn't, his backbone is not very good anymore, and it, sometimes he has a shudder when he's going. So we're now thinking that if there's portages, we may have to figure out a way to line this boat because that seems to be safer for carrying his poor broken back. I really hope we get through these rapids in the next few days. I, they stress me out uh, more internally than externally. I try not to show it, but um, I'm not having as much fun in the white water as I used to. I just want to be through it. I just want, and, and not only for myself and our safety, but just for the boat. I mean, we all care about the boat and any major damage to the boat is going to be a huge setback for us that may even end the trip. I mean, the trip could be done in if we do in the boat again. So it's every bump, every grind, every rock that we're trying to avoid just makes me nervous and I just want to finish the rapids. This is Kakfa Rapids, an average set of rapids on the Northern Haze. 200 years ago, York boat crews ran these waters confidently. Paul is tentative. He charts the course by foot and hopes for the best. So what are the options for getting the boat down here? Uh, we have three channels, one and a half meter drop over shallow rocks, far right, not very good. Middle is uh, death by Bob <laughs> over sharp rocks. Really, really bad. This looks a little bit better. It's fast. We don't know how deep it is. It looks, looks kind of shallow in some places. And you just got to guess a lot of times. Their quest has become a series of guesses. Run the channel or portage the York boat. No one knows. The York boat is a very demanding beast. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but it is hard work, and it, and it takes and it takes concentration, and it takes timing, and, and I think as a group we're really starting to coalesce. At, you know, today, today and yesterday in the rapids that we were running, uh, things were just clicking really, really nicely. Oh yeah, especially with uh, seven other strangers, like just to uh, 
to be with them for that long without beating any one of them up yet is <laughs> something. <laughs> They've come this far with teamwork and humor. A few weeks ago, they were strangers. Now, there are no secrets. <laughs> Wipe your ass with it. <laughs> We were talking about pooing the other day, and this is a very good toilet paper. Yeah. You just brush it <laughs> off the needle. See, there's a couple of needles in there. You take the needles out, and it's very sturdy. You also take the dirty part off the back, too. No, you wipe with this end. <laughs> Check you know the, it. Uh, you know, the red moss is the, re is the best. It I doesn't like have dirt on either side. I've emptied about uh, 200 pails of water out of Bob. Starting this morning, did 100 right away. And then the bailing is nonstop. That goes on all day. The beauty of the haze is an illusion. It is a dark and deadly river. Three days after the relaunch, the York boat is approaching another set of rapids. They look innocent. They are not. Reverie turns to panic. They have made a mistake. Ken Albert Jr.'s fears are about to be realized. In the chaos, the York boat is swept away. Without warning, Rob Clark dives into the icy waters and saves the boat. What did it hit, Baron? We hit a rock. I could feel it. It just went down. The rock's still going to get that boat. Luck was with them. The York boat and Rob Clark escaped serious injury. I'm actually thinking maybe we should call Bob Patches. <laughs> Fixing the boat is now second nature to Moritz. Beaten, bruised, and scarred, Bob is patched up once more. I don't think bringing me down to where Rob was, I don't think that would have made a big difference. If it was even possible. Like, I think we're on right. We were, we were on the right course. We just, uh, we just. We were five feet. It. We were five feet long of where we should have been, Pablo. I mean, you can't. No. There's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. No. I just want to make sure that that, that we're doing everything. You know, that we're not. We've not been raised. five feet further upstream. We got around that. We'd have been laughing. I feel like we're in like the ninth round of a super heavyweight <laughs> fight. Bob against the Hayes River. Boom! We just got a good couple of guts and then a pow! Right in the chin. Bob goes, whoa! Against the ropes. <laughs> right now he's struggling. Oh, shaking it off and then we're gonna keep on going. I seen it coming. Oh. Rob? She can't do anything, just roll harder. And... Rob? Drag, drag port hard starboard. Day 55. The York boat is approaching a final set of rapids. After this stretch of white water, the danger will lessen. But not yet. Nobody panic. The end of the rapid sort of kind of finishes with a hole and then a quick turn to the right. All we got to do is put our oars, drop, starboard. These rapids are especially treacherous. Paul gives the crew the option of hiking around while he takes the boat through. You know, we might get close to shore, but we'll be all right. 
Absolutely. I'm in. Go, Maze. Go, man, go. They decide to stay together. No, I'll go. This will be the 34th set of rapids. Running them captures all the glory and heroism of the Yorkman's life. Late August on the haze, dampness is everywhere. The crew are keeping Yorkman's hours, up at dawn to bed at sunset, work and sleep and work again. Around them, the land is changing. The forests of pine and tamarack are dissolving into the bleak northern tundra. The air is chilled by an ice wind off the bay. Three degrees south of the Arctic Circle, the bugs are gone, replaced by a curious seal. They have come a long way and have paid their dues. It is their 60th day in the year 1840. I am a little bit bummed out, um, but we're uh, back rolling along again, and everybody's everybody's feeling pretty positive, so I'm. I'm picking up on everybody else's positive vibes, and we'll do all right. Hudson Bay is the realm of storms. The tides run high. The north wind cuts to the bone. Less than 100 kilometers from York Factory, they row all day, but go almost nowhere. The headwinds are too strong. Pretty typical, yeah. Northerly winds off the lake, off the ocean, not the lake. No more lakes. <laughs> uh, yep, 90, let's say 88 clicks to York Factory. Well, basically, uh, Hudson's Bay freezes up in the winter time, and uh, it's the home for polar bears hunting uh, ring seals in the winter time. serve their strength, the crew seek shelter in the bush. Cold and windblown, 
they are getting noticeably weaker. <laughs> I'm getting pumped up for the big push. <clears throat> just storing up all my energy and just getting, getting ready. Good evening. Getting tired. It's going to be a long night. <clears throat> long night of rowing, but uh, I think we can do it. It's a little overwhelming to think that this is the uh, last night of a 1,200-kilometer journey. <laughs> yeah, it's historic, isn't it? And uh, I don't know. It's all very weird. The whole thing has been just whipping by, and here we are at the, the edge of uh, finishing. It's pretty amazing. Anxious to finish, they decide to row all night. A dangerous choice. The current is strong. It could sweep them far into Hudson Bay. Okay, Pablo. Hi, it's very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Every day it's a different movement. The cold arch of the northern sky is a good sign. It means the wind has dropped. As they slip through the darkness, Jeff Cowie, as his great grandfather may have done, looks for sandbars. How's it look, Jeff? You looking good? Paul Gosson is on the steering oar. And Moritz, as always, rose. Meaning you can't see anything. We're relying on the grace of God to get us through uh, to York Factory this evening. Well, in 61 days, my uh, my pursuit of the quest for the bay has been uh, more a uh, uh, I guess a goal of personal satisfaction. The fact that I was able to. Uh, spend it with seven other stalwart people. It just made it look that much better. I think it's a fitting end to 1,200 kilometer journey. This is a express York boat. It doesn't stop anywhere else except York Factory. Daybreak. They are exhausted. But the morning skies are clear, and there is no wind. This could be their day. afternoon of day 61, and a storm is chasing them north. Sensing the end of the journey, Ken Albert Jr. rose like the desperate Yorkman he's become, driving Bob towards the bay. Yeah, there's a few times I thought Bob was done, but the team is so strong, nothing could stop him. The team is strong. Not for its physical strength, but for its character. A hydro lineman and a river guide. A teacher and a student. A rock band manager, an academic, a businessman and a carpenter. Ordinary Canadians doing the extraordinary. Eight more dead to keep people I've never seen. Helping each other out, picking each other up. I don't know. It's a privilege and an honor for me to have all these friends of mine with me on this trip. A sense of relief that we're finishing when we are. Glad to be here. This has been a real odyssey and an adventure. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm really proud of the whole crew for what they've accomplished. And this has been, you know, by far the most physically, emotionally, and psychologically grueling trip that I've ever done. I'm honored to be able to have done this, and um, I'm really happy we made it here. What was the question? <laughs> I'd like to thank God for looking after us on this most dangerous, most dangerous trip we took. And I'm really proud of this crew. Really beat the odds to get here. 
Mine's kind of sad a little, a little ways, because uh, gone, re grown really attached to the, the crew, and uh, we just are just a great bunch of people, and it's too bad it's all going to end in about 20 minutes. In two days, we're going to be back in the city resuming our lives, and uh, this is it. I'm not sure really what to feel. I think uh, in a few weeks, I'll have a better perspective on this whole business. It's a pretty amazing moment, though. It's a long way. We've come a long way. I see the white observation Put tower of York Factory. Hard, hard, hard. Let's go into the eddy here. Reverse, starboard, forward, forward. Oh, smart, 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 let's go. Yeah, it's current. Forward. Almost there. Oh, yeah. My name is Gordy Ross. My age is three and thirty. I'm a treatment for the HPC. My work is hard and dirty. Sometimes I ache onto my bones. My work is hard and dirty. My father was an Orkneyman. A fur trade man was he. The fur trade route from Winnipeg to Hudson Bay was one of the great Canadian adventures. The Yorkmen are gone, but their stories survive as they must. They are our legends. A young nation would one day build a railroad of steel. But first came a quest for the bay. When I was but a young lad, I joined the company. I worked the York boats hauling fur for 10 cents a day. I broke my back in a York boat for 10 cents a day. And when you're in a York boat, the work is living hell. And where you'll sleep at the end of the day, there's no one that can tell. And where some sleep in the water's deep, there's no one left to tell. Oh, the river flows, the free wind blows. The seasons pass away And the wild geese fly in the autumn sky But they'll be back someday We worked as trip men on the boats John Louis, Peek and me The rocks and rapids took their boat Someday maybe it's me. It ain't no life for a young man. Someday I'll walk away. But I guess I'll work another season. I just can't seem to save my pay. No, it ain't no life for a young man. I can't seem to save my pay. The 21st century York men complete their quest with pride. Pride in doing what the Yorkmen of 1840 regularly did, sailing to the edge of the great frozen sea and delivering their cargo to York Factory. Oh, the river flows, <laughs> the free wind blows, You're out of here. the seas are stopping. Right on, Isaac. Right on. Right on. Yeah, good but there'll be back someday. I am a Yorkman. My name is Gordy Ross. My age is three and thirty. I'm a tripman for the HBC. My work is hard and dirty. Sometimes I ache unto my bones. My work is hard and dirty.